Our heroine was said to be a vain woman, who sold her beauty to become the Duke's most extravagant woman. This is how Rowena Falone, the Duke of Devonshire's mistress, was seen. The lady sat in front of the mirror and made herself beautiful. She took the powder with a sponge and applied it to her face. The other ladies were discussing her without suspecting that she could hear them. The theme was her purse and dress. One said that such a dress was from the Harden studio, and the wait for it was three months. They also discussed her earrings and necklace, that they were like treasures that were passed down from generation to generation. They thought it was funny that men were delighted with this lady. They whispered that this woman knew no honor, that even if it was well packaged, it was a one-day-old moth. And they were even ashamed of this vulgar woman. The servant swallowed nervously and called Miss Fallone. He told the woman that his lordship was already waiting for her in the carriage, called her to hurry up. Our heroine stood up and swam languidly like a swan despite all the ladies. Her green eyes were incredible. The coachman briefly greeted the woman. He held the reins ready, ready to set off immediately. Soon the carriage was racing along the cobbled street, harnessed to four noble animals. The woman sat on a soft seat opposite the man. She looked sadly out the window. The carriage shook and rumbled. The man asked in surprise why she didn't complain to him this time. His voice brought Rowena out of her reverie. He asked if she did what she was told. The speaker's face was stony. It was Killian Devonshire. The woman was sorry if he was uncomfortable. She assured that she had no complaints. She understood that he was busy and thanked him for his time. Rowena said that today's performance was really good. But then the man interrupted her, roughly grabbing her chin with his hand. She squealed. Killian asked why she was squealing. He asked me to tell him whether he should look his mistress in the eyes now. The woman remembered the words that were whispered behind her back. She replied that she was a little tired, and she apologized if it bothered him. The Duke said that if she knew that she had made a mistake, then she accordingly understood that she must now be punished. He extended his gloved hand and asked to take it off. The woman did not understand that he wanted her. He shook his hand. Rowena quickly reached out her hands to the man's hand. He pushed them away with a pop. Then he put his finger to the tip, letting her know how she should do it. The man asked her to pull his glove with her mouth and take it off. She was surprised and pressed her hand to herself. The woman's heart was ready to jump out of her chest. She squeezed her hand and pressed it to her chest. The Duke was surprised that Miss Fallone did not like his idea. He said that if she didn't like it, then... But she interrupted him. She promised to fulfill his request. Her face was upset. The man chuckled contentedly, and he extended his hand again. And the girl bent down, preparing to grab his glove with her teeth and pull. Soon the glove slipped off the man's hand. He licked his lips lustfully. This excited him. The Duke touched the woman's cheeks with his hand. She shuddered, and her heart beat even faster in her chest. Soon Killian began to kiss her lips and leaned his whole body on top, taking the position on top. The mansion was generously warmed by the bright afternoon sun. The maid was combing the woman's wheaten hair in front of the dressing table. She supposed the Duke must have had a good day, just like he gave bouquets and shoes to the lady. She asked how Lady Rowena liked the performance. The woman replied that she liked it. The maid said that she was so jealous of her. Ordinary people like her could collect three months' salary and buy a ticket. This was the diva's first performance. She said that her brother ridiculed her to her face, but once upon a time she so wanted to become an opera actress. The maid asked the mistress what her childhood dream was. The brush rustled through golden hair. Rowena thought about it. She answered with a pause and a chuckle that she had once wanted to be a novel writer. The maid remembered that the lady had once said that her maternal uncle was a famous writer. The woman confirmed, saying his name was Jeremy Dish. The man with wheat hair told Rowena that if things got hard for her, she should come back. The young girl promised her uncle that she would do so. The maid remembered that he was a writer of detective thrillers. She assured that she had heard his name many times. He said that he was hiding, so he did not appear in public. The maid asked what happened. And if Rowena looks like a young lady, then he must be middle-aged. The blonde said she didn't know, that perhaps she would never meet him again. The last time our heroine saw her uncle was three years ago. She was on the verge of going to the capital and becoming a novelist. And if she had not then accidentally met the Duke on the approaching train, everything could have been as planned. And if she had not trusted her friend who called her to the capital, there was a knock on the door, interrupting her memories. An elderly maid asked permission to enter, assuring that she wanted to tell her something important. The lady told her to come in. The door opened and heavy footsteps were heard. Miss Gertrude, the manager of the mansion, entered. She said that the reason she came early in the morning was to move Miss Fallone to Rockford. The blonde was surprised. After all, the social season has not yet begun. The manager reported that the schedule had moved forward. Rowena was worried that something might happen. She asked if the Duke would go with them. The lady answered briefly, No, 
Our heroine gasped and sighed, and she unobtrusively wondered why the Duke would not go with her. Miss Gertrude said that she would order the maid to start getting ready tomorrow, and asked the mistress to get ready too, that they leave for Roquefort by lunchtime the next day. Having already turned around and leaving, the lady remembered and looked back and said that a letter had arrived, handing the envelope to Rowena. She was told it was from the publisher. Our heroine opened her eyes wide. I was delighted and a little intrigued. She accepted the letter from their hands to the manager with words of gratitude. The young woman held the envelope in her hands with delight and anticipation of something new, and Miss Gertrude glared at her from under her glasses. The manager walked along a long corridor. The lock clicked as it opened. The door to Mr. Duke's office opened with a creak. The owner of the mansion was sitting at a long desk with business papers. The woman came closer and informed his lordship that she had conveyed his message to Miss Fallone. He praised her for her work and allowed her to go. Gertrude hesitated for some time. She asked if it was time to send Miss away. The man turned the paper over, continuing to work. He asked what she meant. The woman swallowed the lump in her throat. She said that the Marchioness of Essex, his aunt, told her that the queen had recently invited the daughter of a foreign magnate. It turns out that the princess is already ripe for marriage, and the aunt added that Killian probably knew what this should mean, since she considered him a smart person. The man looked up from his papers. He understood that his aunt had finally taken on the role of matchmaker, and he was interested in what she was trying to get in return for selling him. Gertrude was shocked. She reprimanded his lordship for such words, and Killian took off his glasses. He asked that Miss Fallone had completed her task and was now useless. The Marchioness asked Killian if this was his way of rebelling against her, and he pretended not to understand what she meant. The woman claimed that she noticed the resemblance between his mistress and his late fiancée. The man insisted that he was not interested in the dead woman, and Rowena Fallone will never become a duchess, and she will never bear him children. Ant did not understand what he wanted. Killian shook the glass in his hand. He insisted that he wanted her to stop trying to match him with foreign princesses and heiresses. The man raised his glass. The Marquise said it was very good. She was sure that in any case he was never interested in one thing for long. And at this moment, Rowena Philon was recognized as the woman of the Duke of Devonshire. However, three years later, he thought the Queen must have begun to worry, because he showed no signs that he was going to send his mistress away. The man tiredly stretched his neck. The manager said that according to rumors, the heiress also had blonde hair and green eyes. That the Marchioness saw her in person, and said that the heiress resembled his late bride even more than Miss Fallone. The man covered his face with his hand and began to laugh. The manager was surprised with his lordship. The Duke opened his eyes and looked intently at his maid. He told Gertrude, grinning, that he didn't even remember the dead woman's face. The man said to himself that everyone thought he was in love with someone, and he saw her only once when he was young, and he couldn't blame the ladies for that. After all, he actually met Rowena for the first time on the train, returning from the woman's funeral. Gertrude was surprised that the Duke would not send Miss Fallone away, even though she had outlived her usefulness. Killian insisted in a firm voice with a straight face that the thing she was talking about belonged to him, and he didn't understand why he had to abandon his precious pet. The woman was sure that her presence could prevent the Duke from finding his wife. The man said that his mother had died a long time ago. The maid shuddered. Then she bowed and asked her to forgive her. The duke waved his hand and said that she could be free. She asked if she could say something else. Killian looked up tiredly from his papers. Gertrude said she suspected Miss Fallone was looking for another man. The horses clopped their hooves rhythmically along the street. People were sitting and lying under the wall. The coachman stopped the carriage. There was a creaking sound. They drove up to one of those houses. Rowena clasped her hands with the letter and pressed it to her chest. She looked out the window with hope. The maid began to get nervous and asked Miss if this wasn't Harlem Street. After all, she said that she was going to do some shopping at the store. She didn't understand why there were men's clothes in the lady's bag, and I didn't understand what was happening. Rowena grabbed the maid's hand. She promised Melissa to tell everything if she promised to keep it a secret. When the heroine's parents went on their long-awaited honeymoon, they contracted an infectious disease and died soon after. No one volunteered to take care of the orphan until her mother's younger brother, Uncle Jeremy, decided to take the girl with him, and she spent the next twenty years in the remote countryside. And when Rowena reached adulthood, she received one letter. In it, a friend suggested that she send her work to a publisher and wait for the results at his home, inviting her to his place. After that, the girl recklessly boarded a train that was heading to the capital, to a place where she had never been before. The girl found that house at the specified address. She opened the door with a creak and called the owner by name. But the house was empty, and there was an envelope on the table. 
It all turned out to be a trap. When she read the message addressed to her, she was overcome with despair. Her friend left a huge debt in her name. She was like a lonely flower growing on the road. Overnight, the girl discovered that debt collectors were hunting her. She ran away, and they shouted after her, Stop! She ran as fast as she could. In that letter, the comrade said that he had no choice, and her uncle made a lot of money from his novels, so she could ask him to pay off the debt for her. The girl ran as fast as she could. She closed her eyes in fear. Her uncle tried to dissuade her from moving to the capital, and the girl didn't have the courage to ask him for help. The men wondered how they could let her leave. It was believed that she could not have run far. They were going to comb the area and find her. The rain was dripping, flowing in rivulets from the girl's hair and clothes. She clutched a small suitcase with her things to herself, hiding from pursuit. She sat down on the ground in a breakdown and sobbed bitterly, and she already regretted that she had not listened to her uncle's advice then. Filona didn't even notice how the carriage drove up, and a male voice called her by name. The door lock clicked. She raised her tear-stained eyes. Mr. Killian was coming out of the carriage towards her under an umbrella. That friend of hers from the train stood next to her under an umbrella in the pouring rain. The girl looked at him with wide eyes. After a short pause, he grabbed her hand, but Rowena tried to break away from him. She asked him to let him go. She said she had to go, but he asked the Duke if she could go where. Killian carefully draped his coat over her shoulders. The girl submitted to his will. He called her to come with him. Our heroine accepted his helping hand and went with him. The man hugged her and covered her with an umbrella. And that's how the girl ended up with the Duke, like the most elegant and vulgar woman. If only she had not believed her friend's letter, and if she had not followed him that night. Perhaps she could start her relationship with Killian off on the right foot. The man has never been one to confess his love, but she knew that he loved her, and the girl loved him too. The couple made love and he was dripping with sweat. Rowena wanted to succeed as a writer in order to repay her debt to the man and become his equal. Now the girl was telling all this to her maid in the carriage. To sum it up, she said that that's why she submitted her work to the publisher. The maid was surprised at such courage. But I didn't understand why the lady had to disguise herself as a man. Rowena explained that this was a precaution. After all, she might run into someone who might recognize her. The girl said that this would be their little secret in any case, and the maid promised Miss that she would not tell it to anyone. A young guy, Rowena in disguise, in a cap was sitting on the sofa opposite the man. They had a conversation over a cup of tea. The man introduced himself as William Zenon, the director of this publishing company. The guy introduced himself as Philip McCarthy. William said he would get straight to the point. He insisted that he liked this draft, but I thought it could have been changed a little. He thought the text itself was great, but the story was a little difficult to understand, and the places visited by the main character seemed too small. The director of the publishing house assured that an excellent job had been done and believed that the girls would be enchanted but he thought the wider public would be interested in crowded bars and parks. I thought that such places would be more familiar to the average reader. The green-eyed guy sat with a sad face. He said with a bow that he himself had never been to such places. The director assured that now he had a chance to experience it for himself. The man said as he stood up that he wished to meet him tomorrow at noon in Conwell Park. He apologetically assured that he had another meeting scheduled immediately after this and said goodbye. When the guy was already leaving, William reminded him that their next meeting would be tomorrow in the park. Philip tried to answer something, but they didn't listen to him anymore. Our heroine, dressed in men's clothing, collapsed onto the soft seat of the carriage. The maid asked her how everything went and whether they signed a contract with her. The girl wearily took off the visor from her head. She replied that they didn't sign. They asked her what they talked about. Rowena said that she did not want to go into details now, but promised to tell everything later and the carriage left that place abandoned by God. The Duke's mansion was brightly lit. One of its windows was wide open. Duke Killian Devonshire himself was generous to his mistress. He was patient enough to overlook small mistakes, and always talked to her, and treated her with a certain level of respect, despite her lower origins. Moreover, the Duke never kept Rowena locked up and did not forbid her to ever leave the castle. But there was one rule that she could never break. The carriage was driving down the street, and this rule was that Rowena had to wait for the duke in the bedroom when he returned home. Gertrude met the girl with a lantern in her hand. At that hour it was already starting to get dark. She said she was late. The girl asked for forgiveness. The manager said that the duke was already waiting for Rowena. The girl twitched. She didn't expect him to return earlier today. She answered, clutching the hem of her dress, that she must first get herself in order. But Gertrude conveyed the order that she should immediately come to the master as soon as she returned. The man was sitting lounging on the sofa. 
There was an open bottle of wine on the table in front of him, and in his hand was a glass from which he took a steady sip of the intoxicating drink. The fire was crackling brightly in the fireplace. On the table next to the wine bottle lay a corkscrew and a cork. A woman's dress lay on the upholstered furniture. There was a knock on the door. They asked his lordship's permission to enter. He told her to come in. The girl opened the door and timidly entered the room. The man turned his head in her direction. The girl looked at him with frightened eyes. She was surprised that he returned so early, and she timidly took another step closer. He replied that sometimes it happens and patted the sofa next to him with his hand. Rowena took a quick look and thought that he must have just returned because he had not yet had time to change his clothes. And she asked why he drinks alone. The Duke took the bottle in his hand and began to pour a thin stream into the glass. He said that he once had a dog. This dog was given to him by the Queen herself. It was a beautiful hound with shiny black fur. The bitch was graceful and smart enough she understood all his commands. The man passed the glass to Rowena. Killian insisted that she was the perfect bitch. The girl listened carefully, and the man pricked a piece of cheese on a fork and brought it into her mouth. For some time, the duke watched the girl chew. He said that that dog was so smart that it brought back the birds he shot even before he ordered it to do so. He said that one day something happened. She broke free and ran away. The girl asked if she ever returned. The man confirmed it. He said that this did not happen until she mated with some mongrel and became pregnant. The dog's belly was bulging. She rubbed her muzzle against her owner's leg as if nothing had happened. The girl gasped, imagining the cute puppies. The duke narrowed his eyes and took a sip from his glass of more wine. He said that he began to wait until the dog gave birth, and then I found a mongrel that looked like those puppies, and he killed them all in front of his dog. Rowena's face changed. The duke said that then his dog tried to bite, so he killed it too. That's why he hasn't had any more dogs since then. Killian told Miss Fallone that he showed no mercy to the dog who betrayed him. The girl thought that the Duke knew about her trip to the publishing company this morning. The man said that if it had been no more than a momentary indiscretion, he could have ignored it. And as he was leaving, he said that it looked like her move to Rockford would have to be postponed a little to another time. He said that he would be very busy soon, so he planned not to stay here for long. The Duke expressed the hope that Rowena would be a good girl until the ball was over. The man left, and the lock on the door clicked, and the girl was left sitting alone, deep in thought. Birds chirped cheerfully near the Duke's mansion. The maid pulled back the curtains on the windows, letting light into the room. She said it was time for Miss Rowena to get up. The girl covered her eyes with her hand from the bright light. I asked Melissa not to do that, but she reminded me that today the lady had a meeting, and it was soon noon. The maid reminded her that the girl needed to meet someone from the publishing house in the park today. Rowena yawned and remembered that she had not told the maid that she was going to that meeting. The girl said, straightening her hair behind her ear, that on reflection she decided that she shouldn't have gone there, that the Duke was already dissatisfied with her, and she didn't want to make things worse by doing something that could be misinterpreted. Melissa wanted to confess something to her mistress. She looked guilty. She admitted that she had read her manuscript yesterday, not the version that she brought to the publishing house, but the other one, the one that was in her bag. I asked forgiveness for this. Rowena assured that it was not worth it and everything was fine. The maid grabbed the girl's hands. She told Miss Rowena that perhaps she didn't understand writing, but I wanted to say that the girl is exceptionally talented, and she wishes she didn't miss this rare opportunity. After all, perhaps they could record it today. Our heroine didn't know what to say, but the maid continued to persuade her that perhaps this was her only chance, and if she returned to Rockford, she would have to stay there for a long time. Rowena took her maid by the shoulder. She said that she was probably right, and she should have gone to that meeting. The girl urged us to do this together. Melissa said she shouldn't be at the meeting. An important issue could be discussed there. And she asked Rowena not to worry. What if she told her where she was meeting, she would accompany her on the way there and back, so that Madame Gertrude does not suspect anything. The girl was happy and thanked the maid Melissa, clapping her hands like a child from excess emotion. At noon, a couple we already knew were sitting on a bench, the director of the publishing house and a young blonde guy. Soon they got up and left. The older one drove. He pointed the way with a finger, business-like holding another in his pocket. They approached from a cafe nearby. The man was telling something, actively gesturing, and the guy stood with his mouth open in surprise. William Zeno, wiping his mouth after a snack. He continued by saying that this is what a typical date consists of. In front of Philip was untouched food and cutlery. The director of the publishing house put the envelope on the table. He said it was a contract. The guy was surprised, but he thought that his story was not very pleasant. The man said that he nevertheless liked the mood and style of writing, 
Meanwhile, he took out a wrapped rose flower from his inner pocket. And besides, the guy accepted his offer and came here today. This meant that he had great potential for growth, and he handed the flower to his interlocutor. Philip wondered why he gave him a flower. The man replied that he wanted to congratulate him on signing the contract, of course. The guy asked if he gave everyone a flower. The man replied that this was the first contract, and every time a writer signed a contract with him for the first time, he gave him a rose. Philip said he was embarrassed, and he accepted the flower with gratitude. The director of the publishing house said that after he put a stamp on the contract, they agreed to continue communicating through Melissa. And that was the end of their business today. Our heroine was sitting at the table and quickly writing something on paper. Melissa brought her a snack on a tray. She asked Miss Rowena how the writing was going. She assured that she was almost finished. The maid said that, according to Madame Gertrude, the Duke was not in the capital at the moment. The girl took a sip of tea from a cup. Melissa thought that this was good, since the lady had more time to work on the manuscript. But it was strange that there had been no news from the Duke for a week. After all, when he left for a long time, he informed about it in advance. Or he definitely contacted Miss Rowena. And now it seemed strange. She reassured herself that he could be very busy. Our heroine lay alone on the bed for a long time. She spun around without sleep. She was haunted by thoughts of how things were going with the Duke. At some point, she realized that she wanted to drink some water. She got out of bed and walked to the door. But when she was about to take the handle, she heard voices, stopped and began to listen to them. One maid said that she heard that Duke Killian was present at yesterday's banquet with Count Vanessa's second daughter. What we heard hurt our heroine's heart. The speaker continued that, given the gentleman's age, she would not be at all surprised if this time the Duke was seriously planning to get married. Another said that to this day the gentleman's aunt, the Marchioness of Essex, manages the country house on his behalf. But she was already old, and it was unclear what would happen to Miss Fallone. The third was sure that the girl would be paid a good sum so that she would leave the life and house of the Duke forever. The maid believed that there was something that could not be discussed openly, but no one in their right mind would give their daughter to someone who has a mistress living in their house. Our heroine's heart almost jumped out. The maid believed that no nobleman would cause a scandal. The first insisted that the queen wanted her nephew to marry someone better than the count's daughter. The third was sure that Killian was still in love with his fiancée, who died three years ago. And so all this time he remained unmarried. The first one said that according to rumors that woman was amazing, and she sighed that the gentleman still could not forget his first love. The third squealed with delight and said that it all sounded so romantic, and our heroine was reeling from what she accidentally overheard. The maids heard a noise outside the door, and they were seriously scared. The first one asked what the sound was, and this was the thunder of a bucket, accidentally knocked over by Rowena. The three girls guessed that someone was behind that door. One admitted that it could be Mrs. Rowena, another doubted it, but volunteered to go check it out. The girl approached the door and asked if there was anyone behind her. Rowena stumbled in fear of being discovered. Miss was wondering what to do. After all, the maids will notice her anyway. The situation was resolved by Miss Gertrude suddenly appearing at the noise. She asked why they were all here instead of working. The maids bowed and asked for forgiveness. They said they were just talking. The lady insisted that whatever they were talking about, they should have been quieter. The girls asked to forgive them. Miss Gertrude pushed the door. Through the crack, Rowena saw the old face of the manager of the Duke's mansion. Her heart beat faster and faster, and she herself tried not to even breathe. The head maid opened the doors wide, but I didn't see anyone behind them. There was complete silence in the room. The lady adjusted her glasses on her nose. She told the young maids that if she caught them again, it would be their last day here. The maids answered in unison that they understood everything. The manager ordered the girl to return to work, and Rowena hid behind the door, covering her mouth, afraid to take an extra breath. And when Gertrude left, only then did the girl sigh calmly. She learned something new by accidentally overhearing the maids talking. The carriage drove up to the publishing house. In the carriage, Melissa wished Miss Rowena good luck. She said that when she published her first book, she would expect a copy from her. Fragile legs in heavy men's boots climbed the stairs. The girl recalled that conversation between the maids. With such thoughts and a sad face, our heroine appeared dressed as a guy at the publishing house that day. She reassured herself that it was just a rumor. She lived as Killian's mistress for three years, and I never noticed any signs that he had forgotten his first love. In fact, he loved her alone. The man played with her hair. He hand-fed her sweets, gave her rare beauty jewelry, admired her charms. The Duke used to walk with her in the park. They went to the Hippodrome together, and the man tried to appear with her in public. When it got cold in the evenings, Killian gave the girl his cloak, 
protecting her from the cold wind, and she pulled it tighter over herself. Williams asked if the guy had thought about his offer. The blonde was in a hurry to take something out of his bag. He held out a stack of papers. He said he thought about it a lot, and I agree to cooperate on such conditions. The director of the publishing house took a look at the brought manuscripts. Previously, Miss Gertrude had given Williams a significant wad of money. He said that she needed him to pretend. The man asked again, not understanding what he was talking about. The lady adjusted her glasses. She said it was all quite simple. And now the man admitted to himself that this lady's manuscripts were much better than he had imagined. But in this world, money was everything. He considered the girl a poor thing. Williams touched his hand to the stack of manuscripts. He said that this was all wonderful. He assured that as soon as editing was completed, they would be able to publish it immediately. Philip beamed with joy. The man went to the window and pushed the shutters. He said that he wasn't joking, and that everything would really happen that way. Below William saw a guy who was clearly waiting for something. He immediately turned away as if he was busy with something. He chuckled to himself. After all, he suspected that the girl would be persecuted. The guy who was waddling in the company of young people was clearly the center of attention. The waiter just left, having set the table for them, and escorted the guest into the hall. He made a hospitable gesture with his hand and asked Sir to come here. The man opened the door, and a guy with a naked torso surrounded by girls appeared to his gaze. One nymph had asked the guy to say am and fed him an olive. The other one was giggling sweetly nearby. Here in our story, the illegitimate son of Count Felix appears on the scene. He was chewing an olive that had just been put into his mouth. His chest and neck were covered in woman's lipstick. He was surprised to see the Duke of Devonshire, and he asked how he owed such an honor. The waiter asked for forgiveness. Killian said accusingly that he could see that Felix was still living like trash. The guy could not understand why the guest was surprised. He kissed each girl and waved goodbye to them. They told him to call them again and run away. Felix threw his shirt over his shoulders. The Duke sat down on the sofa and asked what he had for him. The guy joked a little more and got down to business. He tightened the belt on his clothes. He assured that illegal import of alcohol was taking place in the southern port. The Duke said that he knew this. After the Queen banned the import of alcohol, only authorized persons could bring it into Easelwood. Smuggling alcohol was a serious crime. For this, all property was confiscated and even sentenced to death by guillotine. But some still tried to import alcohol, despite all the risks. The reason was simple. It was a very profitable business. The guy remembered that the Duke told him to carefully find out about this, so he wasn't going to act like the secret police. The automatic lighter clicked. The Duke was lighting a cigarette. She hissed. He said that he wanted to take everything for himself. The guy couldn't believe it and asked him again. Felix was surprised that he was going to betray the Queen. He assured me that this was a huge risk, and it was not for him to warn about this. He asked if his duke was not enough. Killian insisted that he was not interested in money. The interlocutor was completely confused and asked what was the point then. The room was filled with cigarette smoke. The duke raised his hand and said that he was interested in the power that big money gives. He reported that he was interested in such power that no one would tell him what to do and when to do it. To keep everyone in your fist. Killian wanted power to rival that of the queen. Everything was clear to Felix that the Duke sought to strengthen his power in the shadows, but he reminded that he asked him to find out something else. But before that, the guy wanted to ask what it was about. The guy said, holding out the envelope, that the one in question was the president of the publishing house, that someone was watching them. And they went to the park, and then to a restaurant with a miss disguised as a man. He couldn't understand why the lady was dressed like a man, and presumably they were talking about the manuscript. In the photo that was in the envelope there was Williams, with a guy with very similar features to Rowena. The Duke was finishing his cigarette. He said the pieces of the puzzle were finally fitting together. The Duke of Devonshire was getting into the carriage. The guy asked where my lord would order. He asked to be taken to where Miss Fallone was. He also gave orders that someone was needed to keep an eye on Gertrude. The servant clarified that he wanted him to find a quiet and inconspicuous person, and he promised that it would be done. The guy took a while to write something down in a notebook with a pen. The Duke suddenly remembered that the Marchioness of Essex was coming today. He assumed that she had already arrived. Over the mansion of the Duke of Devonshire, the sunset gilded everything around. The windows in the house lit up with soft light. The street lights were shining brightly. An older lady in bright clothes and a dark hat with voluminous jewelry opened her arms to her nephew Killian. Behind her stood Gertrude and Rowena with their heads bowed. The aunt hugged her nephew. He asked how her whites were. She replied that it was wonderful and simply wonderful. The lady reported that she had a conversation with the queen. 
At that time, Rowena still stood drooping. The man did not listen further to his aunt. He asked Miss Fallone what was wrong with her, and he stepped towards her. The girl was clearly upset about something. She addressed him stuttering from suppressed tears. Killian looked at her face carefully. He asked the girl that someone had slapped her in the face. The lady told Rowena that her master asked her a question, but she only clutched the hem of her dress. Earlier, the Marquise had read to Miss Fallone that because of her, her nephew's reputation had deteriorated. She asked if she knew this. She said that he was young and had needs. That's why they tolerated her. It's better to let him sleep with her than with just anyone. I just asked her not to forget to take contraceptives. She said with a shrug of her shoulder that if the girl gets pregnant and disgraces the Duke even more, she will not tolerate it. Rowena said that the Duke really cared about her, and if she becomes pregnant from him, then the Marquise will no longer decide anything here. The woman was furious. She swung her hand and hit Miss Fallone in the face with a resounding slap. And now, when asked by the Duke, the girl said that she behaved stupidly in front of Mrs. Essex. Killian asked Miss Essexus over his shoulder to explain what happened. The lady in the hat shuddered. The man narrowed his eyes. He asked how his stupid and ill-mannered mistress showed disrespect for his beloved aunt. The Marquise insisted that her nephew must have understood everything wrong. And the man said that he was just trying to find out what happened in his house. He took off his jacket and handed it to the maid. I asked my aunt what he misunderstood. And I thought it all was somehow strange. The Marquise glanced sideways at the manager, Miss Gertrude, and she swallowed nervously. And she replied that when Miss Fallone came down the stairs, she spilled tea on the Marquise's coat. Miss Gertrude insisted that it happened by accident, and the Marquise was afraid. The lady nodded in response, and she said that she was just teaching the girl a lesson. After all, she dared to spill tea on her. Aunt told his lordship that Miss Gertrude was telling the truth. The Duke's squinting did not promise anything good. Rowena said that her hand trembled, and she made a mistake. For this, they gave her a slap in the face. She assured Killian that she was fine and asked him not to be angry. The girl grabbed his shirt sleeve, but he unhooked her hand. He asked her to close her eyes and ears and go upstairs. Rowena quickly ran up the steps. Dishes fell to the floor from the cabinet right at the Marquise's feet. She pulled the Duke of Devonshire down. He gasped and said that it was an accident. Aunt asked him not to do this. The man asked her if she didn't want his mother's tea set, who had received it from the Queen. The Duke told her to catch. He claimed that it was his gift for her lesson. He suggested we try again, and he was holding a green cup in his hands. Now the dishes flew into the door next to the lady. Out of fear, she covered her head with her hands and began to scream while crouching. Miss Gertrude rushed to the Marquise's aid, and the Duke spoke with regret that his aunt never caught one. The shelf with the service was empty. Killian said that he remembered that his aunt also liked those swords on the wall. The Marquise hiccuped nervously in fear. The Duke froze, deciding which one to take but Rowena squeezed him from behind. She asked the Duke to stop. The girl asked to do this for her sake. She said that she was afraid of him. The girl said that it was all her fault, but the man tried to free himself from her and sharply reminded her that he had told her to go upstairs. But she began to go limp, so he had to grab her in his arms to prevent him from fainting. The girl's face was covered in tears. Afterwards, our heroine lay on the bed and asked for a drink. The maid Melissa sat next to her. After some time, Miss Rowena came to her senses, the maid thanked God for the health of her mistress. She offered her to drink some water. The girl took a sip of water from the glass and thanked the maid, but she couldn't understand where she was now. The interior of the room was unfamiliar to her. Crystal chandeliers, sconces, paintings on the walls. Everything was new and unusual for her. Melissa told the lady that this was another estate of the Devonshire family. She admitted that she had never been here before either. Through the glass of the balcony, one could see blooming tulips. Rowena remembered that yesterday, she was very excited and on the verge of a nervous breakdown. But I didn't remember how I got here. The maid said that she wouldn't remember. After all, according to the local maids, last night the Duke carried her in his arms while she was unconscious. Rowena tried to comprehend what had happened, and she was interested in the question of what happened next to the Marquise and Madame Gertrude. Melissa hesitated, not knowing how to put it mildly. But then there was a knock on the door. The maid entered the room exactly one step at a time and asked Miss if she was awake. The woman introduced herself by name. Her name was Bianca, and she was the manager of this estate. And Rowena thought to herself that if she was the manager, then she was a member of the same circle as Gertrude. The maid said she would bring breakfast. The girl thanked her, but she fidgeted with the blanket in indecision. Soon a cart with fresh food arrived. Bianca said it was breakfast for Miss. When Rowena looked, she was surprised. After all, these were all her favorite dishes. The maid was glad that the mistress liked everything. The girl got out of bed, 
but Bianca stopped her, saying that she had brought a tray so that it would be convenient for her to eat. Rowena felt uncomfortable. She asked where the duke was now. The maid replied that he had left early in the morning to discuss with the king's deputy the taxes collected this year. The duke told the servants that he would be back for dinner, and Bianca said that if the girl needed anything, she would ring that bell on the table. Rowena hesitated. The maid asked what Miss Fallone wanted. She asked me not to talk to her so respectfully, but the girl thought to herself that she had never been treated like this, and she didn't even know how she should have talked to the servants here. There the servants whispered behind her back. Melissa asked why Miss Rowena did this. She assured that she deserved the respect of the servants. Bianca also confirmed this, and she said that besides, the Duke ordered them to take good care of her. And while Miss Fallone was here, she wanted her to feel at home. After a while, the carriage drove up to the mansion. Bianca bowed to greet the master. He asked what news there was, giving her his outerwear. Rowena came down the stairs in a chic dress. The Duke approached her. She shuddered nervously at his gaze. The man extended his hand to her, urging Miss Fallone to trust him. The girl felt awkward. She touched his hand. He asked if she had already had dinner. She replied that not yet. Killian then suggested having lunch together, and he offered to do it where she wanted, gently caressing her face. Our heroine expected that the Duke would begin to reproach her for her intervention yesterday, and now she happily agreed to his proposal. The bridge led to the front entrance of a luxurious restaurant. All of its windows were on fire, hospitably welcoming visitors. When the girl, accompanied by the Duke of Devonshire, entered the hall, it was empty of visitors. Killian grabbed the cutlery and started eating, and Rowena looked around. The man asked the girl how she liked the new house. She replied that he was simply wonderful, and more than she expected. The Duke asked what about Bianca and the servants and maids. The girl assured that they were all so kind to her. Killian replied that he was glad to hear that. Rowena realized that the Duke always gave her the best. And unlike other aristocrats, he did not throw expensive parties or show off his wealth. But today Killian booked a whole restaurant, and it was very strange. Meanwhile, the Duke was dabbing his mouth with a snow-white napkin. He said that from now on, Rowena would live there for the duration of the points. The girl hesitated for a while, but then she asked what happened to Madame Gertrude and the Marchioness of Essex. There was silence at the table. Our heroine began to fidget nervously in her chair. The Duke paused. He twirled the glass in his hand and announced that disciplinary methods had been used against Madame Gertrude, and the Marquise was going on vacation for six months to improve her health. The Duke assured the girl that she would never see them again. She groaned and said it felt good, and she praised the heavens to herself. After all, I thought that Killian would treat them more harshly. The main character narrowed his eyes and reasoned to himself, a pure, generous country girl, and the bitch who seduced the man. He tried to understand how much truth was in it and how much was a lie. He came out of his reverie and addressed the girl by name. He asked her if she knew a man named William. She was silent. He asked why she was silent. Rowena was weighing whether she could tell the Duke the truth. Her lips twitched and her chin trembled. Looking at his serious appearance, the girl decided that he would not believe her. After all, from the beginning he behaved normally, and then suddenly he did something. Like, for example, on vacation. The male employee asked permission to escort her to the mansion, and he offered to take her under an umbrella. The girl gratefully agreed. But suddenly that employee left the island, and that store closed. And now she thought, what if she told the truth? Either Melissa will be fired, or the publishing house will go bankrupt. Rowena said that William was an old friend of hers. He came to town for a few days, so she met him once. The Duke was surprised why the girl dressed up as a man. She twitched with her whole body. It turned out that he knew about that meeting. She answered that they just had lunch together and there was nothing between them. The Duke clarified that it was her old acquaintance. She just nodded silently in response. Already at the mansion, Melissa was washing Miss Rowena. The water splashed and steamed. The girl was sad. That conversation about William ruined the whole evening. On the way home, none of them spoke. The Duke sat opposite the girl like a pouting owl. He didn't even look at his beautiful companion. And now in the bathroom, she sighed and thought that he was angry with her. Meanwhile, Melissa was combing the girl's hair. The maid was worried about Miss Rowena and asked how she was feeling and why she wasn't feeling well. The girl insisted that she simply ate too much at dinner. Our heroine tried to be distracted by a rose flower in the bathroom. She wondered to herself if Killian had somehow found out about her plan. But then she calmed herself down. After all, if that were the reason, he wouldn't ask her as if he wanted to check something. And he would have already taken action. But then steps were heard in the bathroom. Melissa heard them first and looked over her shoulder. The maid involuntarily gasped, and the hairbrush slipped from her hands onto the floor. The girl asked what was the matter. 
She also looked over her shoulder and stopped mid-sentence. Killian stood behind her, and he looked extremely reserved, which did not bode well. The Duke briefly threw a menacing glance at the maid to leave him alone with Rowena. She immediately ran away from the bathroom. The door behind her clicked shut. The man raised the girl's chin with his fist, and she flinched from his harsh address. And she asked his lordship what she did wrong, and he looked at her intently. The girl blushed all over. The duke pulled her by the hand, and holding her by the waist, looked into her eyes without blinking. Killian leaned towards her face. The girl twitched nervously. The man asked her to remove her hand. Water was dripping from the tap. Rowena sat on a soft chair, wrapped in a terry robe, still moaning from languor. Meanwhile, the duke was fastening the buttons on his shirt. Killian was already stomping towards the door, muttering something. Rowena asked him to wait. She called him by name and hesitantly tugged at his sleeve. The girl asked the duke if he loved her. I asked him to say that he loves me at least a little. She waited for his answer. And I thought that I couldn't help but ask him about it because I was starting to doubt. Rowena asked if he was tired of her. Will he leave her? She pulled his clothes, demanding attention to herself. The duke answered vaguely that he did not know for sure. Our heroine's heart began to beat faster. The girl thought that the duke had misunderstood her reaction in the restaurant, and if she confesses her feelings to him and tells the truth. But he pulled his hand back and walked away. Without turning to Rowena, the duke told her to be quieter than water and lower than the grass. He said that then he wouldn't get tired of her. The door creaked, and Killian left. The metal chain clanged. The prisoner sat on his knees, and the servant held him by the hair. The Duke of Devonshire sat opposite him on an easy chair in an imposing pose. Killian said that he repeats the same thing every time, and he admitted that he was getting pretty tired of all this. The man asked who he worked for, and was surprised that it was so difficult to answer him. He came closer, and he assumed that he was dumber than he thought. The prisoner's face and shirt were covered in his own blood. Apparently a sincere conversation had already been held with him. The Duke assured that he played his subordinate well, and stole their information a little, which means he wasn't stupid. His hand cocked the pistol with a click. The muzzle was pointed at the prisoner's face. The duke was sure that the southerners were smart, and no one could have thought that they foresaw that he would participate in this. The prisoner assured that killing him would achieve nothing. Killian asked who said he would kill him. A shot rang out, and it was followed by a scream. The man screamed that he had been shot in the leg and howled in pain. The duke and the servant walked away. The servant handed the master a white napkin. The blonde said that their prisoner screamed like a slaughtered pig, he asked what they should do, and I was sure that this could be perceived as a declaration of war. Killian said they received a gift, and it will be rude if you don't respond in kind, but they still could not solve this through negotiations. The wounded prisoner said that he could predict fate. He said that Killian Maximilian Devonshire would die a terrible death. The Duke froze in place, stopping. The prisoner continued that his mongrel would be allowed to go around in a circle until she... But he couldn't finish. He was interrupted by a shot. The duke held the prisoner by the hair and asked him to finish the sentence he had started. The servant fussed about next to his lordship. He stood up and said that he had changed his mind. He ordered the body to be chopped into pieces and thrown in the harbor. The blonde ordered the worker to hurry up and clean everything up, and he dragged the body in a bag. Killian wiped the blood from his hands. His face was pleased. The servant only asked not to say that it was his lordship who shot this spy in the head. Killian asked Jenin what he was doing, and he was surprised that he could just stand and watch. The servant frowned. The old man grumbled. He said that he knew that he was just a dog who had not been taught anything in life, but he believed that this was not an excuse to allow the gentleman to get his hands dirty in blood, and he said that it seemed like he paid him a lot more money than he deserved. The blonde clenched his teeth in frustration. He was trying to say something to Mr. Sussex. Baron Benedict Sussex appeared in our story. While Jen and Cleven, Killian's right hand since childhood, protected him, Mr. Sussex was the one who helped bring it to light. Unlike Gino, who came from poverty, Benedict was the personification of the aristocracy, and he believed that such scum could not be trusted. The Duke's assistant asked Mr. Sussex, gritting his teeth, if he was really hinting that he would like to die. The gray-haired man replied that the dog had finally begun to show his teeth. Killian barked, that's enough, and threw away the bloody napkin. He offered to discuss their next step. Benedict said that Glitters, the company they secretly opened for financial activities, began to become increasingly suspicious. And the only way to avoid this is to accept the Queen's wedding proposal. The Duke jerked. He believed that this conversation was a thing of the past, and Benedict was then most against it. Mr. Sussex insisted that there was another reason why Killian should accept this offer. He was sure that every day they attracted more and more attention. 
and if the queen finds out that he is organizing a rebellion behind her back, then Miss Fallone's safety will be in jeopardy. The duke clarified that he meant that he should have lived like a royal puppy. Benedict explained that this was not true, but that he could use it to his advantage. Mr. Sussex asked the duke to pretend to accept the queen's proposal, and he himself will use the woman the queen chose for him to distract attention from other things. Killian frowned, and Benedict continued that it is worth doing this if he wants to consolidate his power among ordinary people, so that no one dares to tell him what to do. Even though the Devonshire family was a noble family with a long history, prestige, and wealth, it all came to an end when she began to exert a strong influence on Easelwood. The last Mr. Devonshire was a quiet and timid younger brother. He married according to convenience to the one chosen by the queen. The next year, immediately after Killian's birth, he left the palace saying that he had fulfilled his duty, and ten years later he burned alive along with his mistress in a fire. Killian thought it was too suspicious for an accident, and hardly any investigations were carried out then. Benedict wrote Devonshire's wedding contract himself and was at the center of it all. There was a clause in that agreement that stated that if the mistress asked for a divorce because of the master, then she would receive alimony. But if the gentleman dies from an accident, then instead of alimony, the lady will receive a pension. The duke thought that there were rumors that the queen had arranged everything so as not to pay huge alimony payments. Immediately after his mother received restitution, she returned back to her country. And Killian, a child abandoned by everyone, was given land and an island by the queen. She must have wanted to free herself from the guilt of making her nephew an orphan, while at the same time making sure he was under her control. Only she had no idea that the helpless child would grow up and put a gun to her head. Benedict said that Lady Chloe, whom the queen chose, was open to negotiations. That woman wanted to start her own business and get out of the shadow of her own father. And if they help her, then both will benefit from this wedding. And after the wedding, the duke could give Miss Fallone any status he wanted. Killian asked if the man said anything. Benedict said that he was interrogated. And he said that Miss Fallone had affairs with William Zeno. The duke twitched nervously. He said that he was a little late, that he was simply the head of the publishing house to whom Miss Fallone showed her manuscripts. Gertrude told him about this. Benedict told his lordship that this was not true. And they have a witness. A servant girl was brought in. It was Melissa. Fidgeting nervously, she introduced herself to his lordship. Killian coldly asked her if she had been watching her mistress's every move. She answered in the affirmative. He wondered if she had anything to report about Miss Philo. The girl shrank all over. She insisted that Miss Fallone had, that is, had an affair with Mr. William. Melissa said that Rowena told her that they were in love as children, and she ran into him again. What Rowena thinks is that after the wedding the Duke will leave her, and so she wants to get as much money out of him as possible before leaving with William. The Duke listened silently, gritting his teeth. That evening it rained like buckets. The mansion stood as a gloomy and inhospitable monster. The Duke paced nervously around the room. He never allowed traitors to go that far. His nanny, who sold all his information to the Queen when he was fourteen. His friend who took part in an attempt to kill him while he was studying abroad. And the teacher, only pretending to be his mentor, used the Devonshire house for the sake of his career. All those people disappeared without a trace. There were no exceptions. The Duke resolutely opened the door. The girl hummed sleepily. She was already fast asleep. She asked in amazement if it was a dream. Rowena said that his lordship had never looked at her while she was sleeping before. She realized that this was not a dream. The man confirmed this. The girl said with a smile that then she would like to benefit from it, and she prepared her lips for a kiss. Killian knelt on the bed and it creaked. I asked what she wanted to say. The girl asked if he would stroke her head until she fell asleep. The duke climbed onto the bed and lay down next to him, hugging the girl and caressing her head. But his face remained tense. Rowena said that she was so happy that she didn't want to sleep at all. He said, now, and covered her eyes with his hand. Soon the peaceful sniffling of a soundly sleeping man could be heard. Killian stood up quietly. Our heroine woke up that morning in a good, upbeat mood. She thought she had a wonderful dream that night. She dreamily stroked the sheet with her hand. She sat on the edge of the bed, dangling her legs down. Five days have passed since the trip to the restaurant. The publishing house that wanted to publish her book closed, and the manager said that he didn't know the man named William Zeno at all. Rowena covered her face with her hands and cried. She knew that she had been deceived and sighed. It was a ball of tangled threads, not life. The girl was thinking how she could fix everything now. There was a knock on the door. She said without turning around that she was glad that Melissa was here. Rowena asked the maid to help her collect her hair but behind her was a man's silhouette. The duke touched the girl by the ear. He called her by name. She caught his hand with her fingers. 
The girl looked over her shoulder. His lordship asked her to leave her hair as it was. He assured her that it suits her better. Rowena's heart was jumping out of her chest. The man's touch was so foreign and familiar at the same time. She asked if it was not a dream, the duke retorted, but as if she herself wanted it. He admitted that he crossed the line last night, kissed her on the head. Rowena felt that now was the time to tell him everything. She thought it was stupid and shameful, but she should have confessed everything now. She began that she wanted to talk to him about what he asked her yesterday. The man gently touched her hand. He told Miss Fallone that he had thought about it a lot, and I realized that it was stupid to keep her for so long only as a mistress. Meanwhile, he put a ring on her finger. The girl froze. The central stone sparkled like a diamond. She stammered to his lordship. The man asked from now on to call him by his name, just Killian. She wanted to tell him something about the ring, but he interrupted her. He said it was a gift, and it should have been done earlier. Rowena asked, clasping her hands, if he was sure that he wanted to give this ring to her. The duke asked if she thought that he had confused her with someone else, and he stroked her face tenderly. Rowena began to tremble slightly from an excess of feelings. She threw herself into Killian's arms and pressed her whole body against him. The man squeezed the girl in his arms. He admitted that from the day she greeted him on the train, one question had been stuck in his head. He denied it to himself for a long time and was rude to her. But no matter how much he rejected it, nothing could change his feelings. And all these five days he thought about how dear she was to him. The girl said that all this seemed like a dream to her, and she was so happy. Killian suggested that she go to her favorite island and spend the summer there together. He asked if she would go with him. The duke said that he still needed to finish some business here and promised to come after her later. He kissed her lips. He assured me that it wouldn't take much time. He asked me to wait for him at the rest house. A sea wave rolled onto the shore and immediately retreated. The water was clear and the weather was pleasant. Our heroine stood on the sand and the splashes reached her from the sea tide. The wind played with her hair and blew out the wide skirts of her dress. The girl was sad. Soon a boy of about ten approached her. He called her Madame. She recognized him and greeted him back. She asked Tommy to simply call her by her first name Rowena. The boy was sure that it would be rude of him to call a woman of high status by her name. The boy Tommy was the son of the governor of this island. Rowena patted him on the head. She said that she had already told him many times that she did not have any high status. I asked if he came running on behalf of the governor. He answered hesitantly, no. The boy stuttered and said that he saw her himself and came up to greet her. This island was far from the capital, and once upon a time it was quite deserted. But after Killian developed his business here, the dying economy revived. In gratitude, the islanders are very kind to the duke and his guests. Rowena asked why the boy should not take a walk with her. She said that she decided to take a walk because the weather was so wonderful, and the boy stomped along the shore next to her. Rowena took Tommy's hand in a motherly way, and he thought to himself that she was probably the most beautiful person in the world and the kindest even to a child like him. However, the boy noticed that sometimes concern suddenly appeared in Miss Rowena's green eyes. Tommy told the girl that she was the Duke's special guest and that she will become someone you can't even look at. Rowena cheered up. This, of course, was not what the Duke promised her, and she had been waiting for him on this island for 15 endless days. She thought to herself that she couldn't wait for Killian to arrive, and I was tormented by doubts that if he suddenly decided and something changed in his plans. The boy asked Rowena how soon she and the Duke would get married. The girl shrugged her shoulders nervously. She tried not to think about it. The girl wondered why Tommy decided that she should marry the Duke, but he said that he knew everything. And this was the reason why his father was so busy these days with wedding preparations. The boy said that he heard that the Duke was coming today, and he immediately groaned, afraid that he had let it slip. He asked for forgiveness, assuming that it was supposed to be a surprise. Rowena's eyes widened and she thanked the boy and she began to hug him in joy. She immediately hurried to say goodbye to him, and already on the run she promised to see him later. On the way, the girl reassured herself that it turned out she had no reason to worry. She decided to meet him at the port. The girl ran as fast as she could along the embankment to the pier. On the pier, our heroine saw the familiar figure of Melissa, and she was delighted to meet the maid. She called her name. The maid asked Miss Rowena what she was doing here, and the girl was catching her breath after a fast run. She said that she heard about the Duke's arrival. His lordship Killian Devonshire came down the stairs. Happiness shone in Rowena's eyes. But when she looked closer, she was shocked. The man carefully led a tall blonde with green eyes by the arm. And he looked at her coldly and indifferently. Rowena was confused and wondered who this woman was next to the Duke. She decided not to jump to conclusions just yet. 
The girl assumed that she was just a distant relative who was invited to the wedding. Finally, the Duke deigned to turn to Rowena. He told her dryly that he was glad to see her here, formally addressing her as Miss Fallone. The man introduced her to his fiance, Miss Chloe Aberdeen. The girl smiled politely as a sign of greeting and said that she was glad to meet you. What Rowena heard made her feel nauseous. She apologized for not hearing, but Killian felt cold. Our heroine was plunged into darkness. The girl only now realized that the Duke had brought his bride with him. She remembered the conversation between the three maids, that he was still in love with his bride, who died three years ago, and therefore was not yet married. Then suddenly it came to mind that he said that it was stupid to keep her for so long only as a mistress, that he has some business to do and will arrive a little later. And now our heroine stood on the pier and reeled from unexpected news. And I decided for myself since when everything had changed so dramatically. Miss Chloe told his lordship that it was not worth it, stopping his impulse. She said that Miss Fallone's shock was obvious. Duke told Melissa to take Rowena inside since she felt bad. She helpfully answered him, and she led the staggering girl away. Tears flowed uncontrollably from Miss Fallone's eyes, and the Duke and his bride remained on the pier while their things were unloaded from the ship. The couple chatted happily while enjoying the freshness of the sea. Killian told the approaching servant that they were tired from the journey, and I wondered if the room was ready for Miss Aberdeen. He answered his lordship that everything was of course ready. The Duke asked Chloe's forgiveness for his mistress's bad manners. He insisted that she was a completely uneducated hillbilly. Miss Aberdeen believed that it was hardly a matter of upbringing, and laughingly she assured that she, as a woman, fully understood her. The girl looked from under her forehead at her companion. He was the man she would marry under a business agreement for mutual benefit. That's what she thought when they corresponded. But having met him live in person, her heart changed her mind. She was really worried that her mistress would become the big threat that people described her as. But the Duke didn't waste a minute getting rid of her. And this made her happy. It turned out that she would receive both her father's business and this man's. She took the Duke's arm, and she asked him to show her the island. The Duke's island castle was bathed in sunset colors and looked magnificent. Things were scattered on the floor of our heroine's room. A dress, a fan, papers, writing instruments. Rowena was sitting on the bed under the headboard barefoot. Her face was all tear-stained from tears. The door creaked. She twitched all over, even though she was expecting it. The Duke approached the bed. She shouted at him not to come close to her. He asked why she suddenly started telling him what to do. He told Miss Fallone that the scene she made earlier was too provocative. He reminded her that he gave her clothes, food, and a roof over her head. He started touching her face, but the girl pushed him away. She screamed that she didn't need all this. Rowena said that she decided to leave him. On the floor of the room there was a packed bag with personal essentials. The man grabbed her hand tightly and roughly. I asked where she was going. Rowena demanded that he let her go. Duke Killian mocked his pathetic but beautiful lover, and she was all in tears. He carefully wiped away her tears. He said that his wedding would take place in two weeks. Rowena called him a devil, a monster, a cruel, heartless bastard. The girl asked why he gave her that ring, and why did he act like he was going to marry her. The duke chuckled and said that he had never promised her anything, and he simply gave the gift as he always did before. He asked why she was so surprised. He said that she knew how he felt for her. Rowena insisted that she had always been honest with him. She clenched her fists on her chest. She said that she loved him. She wanted to say something else, but the man did not listen to her. Killian threw her onto the bed with a strong push, and he took the position on top. The girl asked what he was going to do. He said that since she loved him, he asked her to prove it. After some time, the girl was lying under the covers. There were bruises on her neck and chest from hickeys. She was in complete prostration, and Killian was lighting a cigarette. Rowena sat up on the bed. She was unsteady. The Duke told her to take this as a sign of goodwill. The man threw a wad of money in an envelope onto the bed. Told me to tell you if you need more. The girl looked with an uncomprehending look. After a while, she laughed hysterically. Killian asked what was funny about it. Rowena asked if he ever loved her. He answered coldly, never. The Duke turned over his shoulder to the girl and said that he was having so much fun. Tears streamed down Rowena's face. From a crack in the door that the Duke had not closed, a strip of light fell on her. The weather was clear and sunny, a dilapidated two-story house. There was a knocking sound coming from it. A strong fist persistently knocked and banged on the door. The owner of the fist called Rebecca. Soon the door opened with a creak. A beautiful blonde with green eyes looked out. She was clearly tired and sleep-deprived. The woman asked to forgive her, making excuses that her son was sleeping. Rose screamed that it wasn't her problem, that Rebecca owes her rent. I asked when she was going to pay. 
She threatened that she might stay outside with the child in the cold. The blonde stuttered and insisted that she was very sorry. She made excuses that her salary was delayed and that she was going to give the payment today. The woman held out a bag of coins. Rose was leaving, and over her shoulder she said that next time, if she was late in paying for even one day, she would be thrown out without further ado. The blonde closed the door behind the woman. She was catching her breath. The boy rubbed his sleepy eyes. He asked his mother what happened. The woman smilingly assured Demian that everything was fine, that the hostess just came in to talk about something. The woman apologized that the noise woke him up, but the boy said that he woke up because he felt cold and was frozen. The mother carefully touched the child's head. She sighed heavily. Her son's temperature rose again. She said they would need to see Dr. McWood again. On that terrible night, our heroine's thoughts about death were dispelled by the premonition that gripped her. Rowena thought that she had not had her period for more than the expected period. Fate has made its move. Her premonitions were justified. She was pregnant. And fearing that Killian would take the child if he found out that he was his father, the girl changed her name and moved to a city in which she had no one. They gave her an old closet, and that was enough for her. Being pregnant, she took on any job, which she had never done before. When all the newspapers wrote that Killian Devonshire and Chloe Aberdeen were moving to another country, she gave birth. It was a child who was so similar to that sweet but hated man. The doctor pressed the membrane of the stethoscope to the child's body while performing auscultation. The young man assured that taking medication regularly would speed up recovery. The doctor said that the disease would soon pass, and I was glad to report that the boy's health was improving. The blonde thanked the doctor, smiling. Damien was often sick. The boy coughed and wiped his nose. The birth was attended by a midwife from the slums, who was called in at the very last minute. And from the moment the baby's umbilical cord was cut, he suffered from many different illnesses. The boy asked if his mother would buy him a toy for praise from the doctor. The woman hugged her son and assured him that she would buy him a gift for the holiday, convincing him that he would be there very soon. The child was happy. She didn't have much money, and she decided to just work more in the evenings and find a part-time job. She couldn't stop blaming herself. My son would not have had to go through all this if he had been born in good conditions. The doctor smiled and handed Demi in a couple of sweets in bright wrappers. The boy asked his mother for permission to take them. The woman felt awkward in front of the doctor. She assured him that he did not need to do this. Just the fact that he examined the boy meant a lot to her. The man reported that his nephew was about the same age as Demian. He asked me to accept this from him as a sign of respect. The woman's eyes became cheerful and she thanked him. The mother, on behalf of her son, thanked Dr. McWood and asked him to bow. The boy said, thank you. The woman said goodbye and said that they would leave already. The door closed behind them with a creak. The doctor asked to be careful. The man heard that Rebecca's husband died in an accident five years ago. A local woman saw her very sad and said that she was rushing from place to place pregnant. And then Rebecca settled here. He was worried about her and her son Demian. His nurse came in and called the doctor. He turned around and asked what happened. The woman said that they came to him, and she thought that the doctor should have come out himself, that the guest says that he is looking for someone, but the man had already entered. Hello. He asked if there was a Dr. Philip McWood. The other two forced the doctor to his knees. He asked who he was. The guest also sat down. He said he would only ask once. Blonde, green eyes, almost thirty years. That her name is Rowena Falone, but she most likely uses a different name now. He asked if a woman matching the description had ever come to the doctor. Dr. McWood thought it might be Rebecca, but he did not speak, answering the question negatively. The man held out a business card. He asked the doctor to call this hotel and ask him to come to the phone if he met one. He promised to pay him a good amount. Introduced himself as Xenos Glitters. He assured that they knew his name. The boy greeted Aunt Harriet joyfully. The woman hugged the boy who rushed into her arms. She asked if he slept well at night. The boy's mother stood modestly at the door. The woman asked if Demian obeyed his mother well. Rebecca asked for forgiveness for leaving her son with her again. Harriet assured her that her children enjoyed playing with Demi. Harriet was a manager at a textile factory, and Rowena's support for five years. The woman ordered the children to go for a walk outside. She was the one who called the midwife and helped with the work in the factory, and our heroine was very grateful. Harriet said she moved here when she herself was pregnant with twins. They were now colleagues who had given birth around the same time, and she thought that she shouldn't have apologized. And if she needed help with anything, she asked her to just tell her about it. Rebecca was going to work the evening shift just like yesterday. She appreciated Harriet's help. She said that she would pick up Damien tomorrow morning. She bowed with words of gratitude. 
Harrietta asked what her friend thought of Dr. McWood. The blonde asked apologetically. The woman said, humming in her ear, that he was clearly interested in Rebecca, and asked if she herself noticed it. The blonde denied this, and was sure that her friend was mistaken about this. Rebecca said that the man was young and single, and she was a single mother. Harriet said they were only a year apart, that her son is growing, and did the friend think that the child needs a father as a support? She was sure that a man like Dr. McWood, but I realized that it was already time. Harriet asked him to think about her words. The blonde saw a newspaper falling on the floor, and she was about to pick it up. Our heroine extended her hand to pick up that newspaper, but she felt a chill when she saw the image and the headline in it. It said that early this morning, the Duke of Devonshire from Rockford returned to Aislewood after separating from his wife. According to sources close to him, the reason for the divorce was Chloe's infertility. A friend called Rebecca. She was in a slight trance. Harriet asked what was there, and what happened to her face. The blonde sighed heavily. Rebecca bowed and said that she needed to go already so as not to be late. A friend asked her not to overdo it at work there. Our heroine ran home. She said nothing would happen, and that didn't concern her. She remembered him saying, I was just having fun. Rowena said that this person was no longer in her life. She was scattering things on the floor and frantically looking for something. Rowena told herself that if they ran away, she needed something that she could sell and get money for it. The woman was holding that same ring in her hand. His stone still sparkled. She did not take the money then and left everything she had but kept the ring. And I did it in case something terrible happened and she could sell it and run away to another place. There was a knock on her door. She asked, Who's there? Twitching nervously. A woman's voice asked Rebecca for permission to enter her. It sounded like the voice of Anna, her friend. The woman exhaled in fear and allowed us to enter. Anna came in and was surprised. She said that she came in to ask if they could go together because they worked on the same shift. But when she saw the mess, she was surprised and joked that someone had robbed her. The blonde denied robbery. She explained that she was just looking for something. She said that she was also about to leave to go to work, but her friend had already seen the shine of the jewel. Rowena continued to think about Killian. She reassured herself that five years had already passed, that perhaps he lives in another country, and that if he wanted to find her, he would have already done so. The woman told herself that the Duke would not appear at her door after so many years simply because he was divorced, and she has no reason to be afraid. The stone from the ring sparkled on the cushions. Anna wondered where such a poor woman got such an expensive ring. She deliberately pushed the glass on the table with her elbow. He staggered and fell to the floor, breaking into pieces. The guest made a frightened face. She apologized for her clumsiness to the hostess of the room. Rebecca said everything was fine and went to get a broom. She was afraid that the guest might get hurt and asked her to stand still. Seeing that the woman had left, the guest reached out her hand for the shiny jewel. She told Rebecca she didn't want to bother her. The blonde, who returned soon, quickly swept away the fragments into a dustpan. Worried, I asked my friend if she had gotten hurt by accident. The ring was already clenched in his fist. The guest said that she would like to make amends to her and help her clean up. A short time later, our heroine's shock from the news from the newspaper passed, and everything became the same. Only now she worked more, and I was able to buy my son a gift for Christmas. As was customary before, Damien often spent the night with Harriet. The boy slept in the same bed with her twins of the same age, and the woman next to them knitted warm clothes in the evenings. The boy called his mother in a dream. He cried because of what he dreamed there. The woman was worried about the child and quietly called him by name. There was a knock on the door. Rebecca came for her son. She asked her friend if he behaved well. The woman said that she was glad when the boy visited them and had fun with her children. The blonde thanked her friend. She said that she does so much for her, but she herself hardly gives her anything in return. Harriet, laughing, asked not to speak like that but to be very careful. When Rebecca left, the woman sat down and exhaled her fatigue. She wondered who Damien's father could be. She was sure that that man must be very handsome if the son looked like his father. If the family was complete and the man was next to her, then Rebecca would not have to work so hard. And Damien wouldn't be so lonely then. Suddenly there was a knock on her door. The woman was scared. She wondered who it could be at such a late hour. The door opened slightly. Her friend Dr. Mackwood was on the threshold. He looked tired and depressed. She asked what brought him here so late. The man apologized, and he asked if Rebecca was here. Harriet said that she had recently left her. The man swore and said that he should have come a little earlier. The woman asked what could have happened that alarmed him so much. He said that some time ago a man came to his clinic, and it seemed that he was looking for Rebecca by signs. The doctor was afraid that he would be watched, so he could not report it immediately. 
and the man said that her real name was Rowena Fallone. Harriet asked if her father was looking for a boy with a woman. McWood said that was out of the question, that he doesn't look like Demian at all, and his name is Xenos Glitters. The woman clarified that this is the one who runs a legitimate gaming house, and Macwood heard that he expanded his business through underground activities, unlicensed lending, and alcohol. The doctor believed that such people were not worth messing with, and he couldn't understand why such a person was looking for Rebecca. He asked him to tell her to be careful. As he was leaving, the doctor looked over his shoulder and asked Harriet to take care of herself. Soon the door slammed behind him, and the woman stood in front of the door trying to untangle the tangle. Unless Glitters was the father of Rowena Fallone's son, could he be the debt collector who was trying to track down Rebecca? She thought that if something happened to Rebecca and Damien, she should have intervened. She clenched her fists. There was a knock on the door. The woman jerked in surprise. They knocked persistently and brazenly. The door shook. At that moment, she thought that she needed a weapon. The soft light of cozy dwellings burned in the windows of the houses. It was late evening in the yard. A neighbor told Rebecca that their colleague Anna was missing, that she asked for a salary in advance and disappeared without a trace. She asked the blonde if she knew where she could go. Rebecca insisted that she was not that close to her. She said that she heard that she lived with a man. The neighbor said that Anna left with him, that the police had already been told, but she thought they would quickly be forgotten. The son slept snoringly on the blonde's shoulder. She prayed that Anna would be fine. The neighbor said that she chatted and almost forgot. She took a box out of her bag and handed it to Rebecca. She said the doctor asked her to give it to her. The baby was sleeping at home under a blanket on the bed. Rowena examined the box, realizing that it was for Demian. She had already told the doctor that there was no need. He was such a good person. The woman opened the lid. There were fragrant sweets inside, and between them lay a note on a small piece of paper. She opened it and began to read its contents. Rebecca. On the other side was written, This is Philip McWood. I know this note took you by surprise. I'll be brief. You are being watched. Please take care of yourself. But standing on Harriet's threshold was a handsome, tall brunette with blue eyes, wearing a hat and an expensive coat. The decoration of the aristocrat sparkled on the collar. The woman asked if he was Mr. Glitters. Did he ask Rebecca about the debt? The man said that he had to say that everything was a little different. The woman asked to forgive her. The man assured Miss Dixon that he would like to make her a good offer. It was dead night outside. The waning month dominated the sky today. There was a knock on the door. A woman's voice called Harriet. A sleepy woman opened the doors. She saw an alarmed friend on the threshold. I asked what she was doing here, surprised that she ran here from home. She clarified what happened. The blonde asked if someone came here to her with threats, or maybe he asked where she lives. Harriet said that she did not understand what she was asking her. She assured me that nothing like that happened. The blonde breathed a sigh of relief. The kind woman asked what was wrong with Rebecca and what was the matter. She assured that everything was fine, that she just needed to make sure. The friend swallowed the lump in her throat. She asked Rebecca on occasion, hasn't her house become too small for her and her son? That it is old and unsafe, that it is full of alcoholics, gamblers, and antisocial people. The woman assured that she knew someone who rented out housing not far from her at a very good price, that there should be about the same fee as in the old place. She said she could put in a good word. The blonde thought about it. The place where Harriet lived was much safer than before. If the rent was about the same as what she was paying now, then she could ask for better terms. But she remembered that note from Dr. McWood, and she began to feel a slight trembling. She told her friend that she appreciated it, but refused. She said that they would soon move to another city. The blonde bowed respectfully, and Harriet asked her again and could not believe her ears. Rebecca said that if a stranger asked about her, she asked him to say that he knew nothing about such a person. The friend asked her to wait, but she was already quickly moving away. Harriet asked over the man's shoulder if he was sure that Rebecca, that is Rowena, would be safe. The brunette replied, absolutely. He approached the woman and handed her a signed check. He said that she could enter any amount she wanted, and she can consider this as payment for looking after his woman. Harriet looked at this with an uncomprehending look. She frowned and said that she didn't need this money, that she only did this because he is the one Rowena needs. The blue-eyed man assured that all he wants is to make Rowena happy. He was noticeably nervous. The woman asked him if he loved her and asked him not to make her unhappy, and he rudely replied that it was none of her business. He said a short, good night, and walked out the door out of the house. Callie in Devonshire of Rockford. The man Harriet knew only from newspapers was Damien's biological father. She was surprised how she had not guessed it before, because the boy was his copy. But it looked like Rowena didn't want anything to do with him. 
but an often ill child like Demian needed to live in better conditions than now. And then she saw anxiety and sadness in his eyes. Just by looking at him, she could tell with certainty that the man was in love, whether he realized it or not. A luxurious carriage was driving through the streets of the town. The horse's hooves clattered rhythmically along the paved street. The right-hand man asked his lordship what they should do, and should they find Miss Fallone. The duke assured that there was no need. He wondered if the person who sold the ring on the black market had been found. The blonde said that it was a woman, and it seemed that she stole that ring. He said his people were watching her. The assistant asked his lordship, Is he sure that he does not need to meet with Miss Fallone now? The duke was thinking that he was grateful to Harriet Dickinson for befriending Rowena when she had nowhere to go. But that was all. And she asked not to make Rowena unhappy. It was funny and surprising in his opinion, considering that until that moment, the woman didn't even know Rowena's real name. Killian asked the assistant what happened to Chloe Aberdeen. He replied that the woman disappeared after signing the divorce agreement. According to their agent, Chloe went to the countryside to recover. The Duke believed that this should have benefited her. The weather was clear and sunny. The Duke of Devonshire's island castle was in all its splendor. Chloe told her husband that since they were married, it would be nice to be faithful spouses. The man simply laughed at this, but that was just the beginning. Contrary to his belief that she would be easy to work with, Chloe turned out to be quite stubborn. She has a new goal, to seduce Killian. She slipped into his bedroom whenever the opportunity arose. There was a time when the man thought that she was forcing herself to do this because of the air he needed. But he felt disgusted, as if he had been cursed. And it wasn't about Chloe. Killian reacted this way to any woman who tried to seduce him, and when her attempts to get attention from him failed, she began to openly cheat. But when the woman realized that her last desperate attempt to provoke her husband did not work, she began to throw scenes at him. She broke dishes, screamed, sorted things out. She screamed at him not to insult her like that. She reminded him that she was his wife. She cried with anger. On the last day of their married life, Killian found his wife in a bathtub full of cold water with a cut wrist. Fortunately, the woman did not lose too much blood, and her wounds were not life-threatening. The Duke placed two papers on the table in front of his wife. The day the woman opened her eyes, he asked her to choose one of the documents. It was a pass to a psychiatric hospital and an application for divorce. Chloe looked at the documents in complete horror. She did not expect such a turn of events. The Duke said that it was normal that she did not want to get a divorce. He was busily straightening his tie, but he said he couldn't just leave her when she had clearly lost her mind. What if she couldn't make a decision now? He was giving her time to think, and he asked me to let him know through a lawyer. At this point, Killian stood up, making it clear that the conversation was over. But after him, his wife asked about Rowena Fallone. Tears streamed down Chloe's cheeks. She asked if he had been cruel to that woman before their marriage. Killian remained silent. He had never remembered this name in the last five years. He replied that this was a crazy question. The woman asked him not to try to deny it, that he sometimes calls her in his sleep. I was sure that he hid it somewhere, that for the sake of his favorite, the Duke of Devonshire remains chaste. Killian claimed that his wife was simply having an attack of paranoia, that she really had gone crazy. And he left, slamming the door in the face of the fictitious wife who had been wooing him so much. The Duke walked along the corridor and talked to himself that these ridiculous accusations of his wife did not even deserve his answer. At some point, weakness overwhelmed the duke and he fell to one knee. The servant who was nearby was alarmed for his lordship. Killian believed it was some kind of curse that had tightened around his neck and consumed his entire life. The duke's carriage rolled down the street. Killian drove thoughtfully. He said to himself, Filoni. The man remembered the first time he saw a smiling girl, and she introduced herself as Rowena Filone. Ever since that cursed name surfaced, Killian had suffered from endless bouts of dizziness and headaches. Memories came flooding back, breaking the dam. The train departed from the platform, sounding its whistle. It was exactly two o'clock in the afternoon. People were chatting and bustling about as they set off or saw off their relatives and friends. A blonde with huge green eyes was holding her hat with one hand, and in the other she was carrying a large travel suitcase. She was clearly confused. The girl told herself that she was really going to the capital. She convinced herself that everything would be fine with her and that she would not stay there herself. The blonde entered the train carriage and walked along its corridor, and the large windows were well lit. She looked around and looked for a third-class compartment in which she had a seat according to the ticket she had purchased. Rowena resolutely grabbed the handle, opening the doors to the compartment. There sat a tall brunette in a dark business suit with a white shirt and a black tie. The girl's green eyes looked at the man, and his blue eyes stared into the beautiful gaze of the charming stranger. 
The girl was scared and timidly apologized. She assumed that she must have mixed up the compartment. She left again apologizing, and in her haste caught her foot on the threshold, tripping over it. The man immediately jumped to his feet like a spring in order to come to the girl's aid in time. A second later he caught her, and was already holding her in his arms. The blonde was all embarrassed and immediately blushed. The brunette told Miss instructively that she should be more careful. The girl was completely frightened, and the stopper took her. The man suggested out loud that she was lost. She briefly confirmed this, saying that she was looking for a third-class compartment, and she hiccuped in fright. The man experienced an unusual feeling, and the girl admitted that she was simply shocked by how cute he was, and she immediately covered her mouth, but it was too late. The man laughed openly. It was not the first time for him to hear compliments from ladies. They rang the bell signaling the departure of the train. The conductor carriage entered. He asked how he could help. The brunette asked to escort the lady to her compartment. He asked the girl to follow him. She timidly thanked him. The man said goodbye to Miss. The blonde looked around and introduced herself as Rowena Falone. The man introduced himself and said his name was Killian Devonshire. The train rushed on its way, taking its passengers into the distance along the track. New acquaintances were sitting in the dining car. The blonde said that someday she would like to sit in a restaurant on the seaside and enjoy a great lunch, so that her favorite flowers would stand on the table and her beloved man would sit opposite her. The man said that her dream was wonderful, and I wondered what her favorite flowers were. She said she loved Edelweiss, that in the country where she was from, there were plenty of them everywhere. She said it was a very calm and beautiful place. However, she never left him until now. It was her first time going to the city, and she was very nervous and excited. Killian said that she should adapt well to city life. He asked for forgiveness and asked how old she was. The girl said she was 20, and in response she asked Mr. Killian how old he was. The man answered briefly that he was 28. The interlocutor exclaimed in surprise. She insisted that she would never have thought it because he looked younger. The girl asked Mr. Killian what his favorite fruit was. She herself said that she liked raspberries. The brunette insisted that it was time for him to go. He said that he was pleased to talk with Miss Fallone. She politely answered him in kind. As he left, the man looked over his shoulder. Rowena was left sitting alone. She even became a little sad. In front of her stood a whole plate of untouched pies. The brunette entered his compartment and slammed the doors behind him. She was thinking as she walked around her compartment about Rowena Filon. He thought she was an attractive girl, but he thought she was too young. There were too many reasons why she wasn't right for him. She was a 20-year-old child, and it was obvious that she was not even from a middle-class family. This must have been their last meeting. But even in the carriage on the way home, after he got off the train, and after he arrived at his townhouse, he could not get the girl out of his head. And the remnants of conscience that still existed did not last long. The Duke was sitting at the table in his office. He called the butler's name Rowena Filoni. He said that the girl was young with blonde hair and green eyes, that she went to the capital recently. He asked her to find it for him. The middle-aged woman obligingly bowed in response. But when Killian received the answer, he was shocked. They wrote that this person was a high-class courtesan who used her blonde hair as a weapon, that she is now on the run because she got into huge debts. The maid asked if it was worth asking someone to bring that person here. The Duke thought for a moment. He remembered how the girl talked with a smile about her homeland, and that she never left those places. It's the first time she's traveling so far, that's why she's so worried. The man was amazed at such an impressive performance. He couldn't think that he couldn't get her out of his mind. His gaze darkened. He told the woman that there was no need, and he allowed her to be free. The maid said that this woman looked similar to the late Lady Angela, that this girl could be useful to him, that the queen would undoubtedly try to arrange his marriage again. The duke thought that he would like to kill her because she had deceived him. But if he could use her to get out of trouble, he wanted no part of it. And when he sees her in his bed one day, he might lose all interest in her. He thought it was a good idea, but he wanted her to suffer a little first. The girl sat in the pouring rain, clutching her travel suitcase. She cried from hopelessness. Killian sat sadly on the edge of the bed. There was a knock on his room and his senior assistant entered. He was holding a piece of paper in his hands. The blonde asked his lordship, why not see that girl from the train again? The duke asked who exactly he meant. The servant said that he meant Miss Fallone, assuming that the duke was thinking about her now. He placed an envelope on the table, and on top of that was the same ring with a diamond as the center stone. The blonde said that after their investigation, they found a clue. That lady settled in a secluded town with a couple of factories, that his people tracked down a suspicious doctor, and he led them to the house of a woman who worked in a factory. 
He said that Rowena rented a dilapidated villa and had been living there for some time. That they also found this ring on a nearby black market. The Duke was thinking, a dilapidated villa, a textile factory. Even if the woman was unfaithful to him, she would still remain his mistress. And if she took the money he gave her, then she would not have to work for the next ten years at least. His temples were pounding. This splitting headache pierced his heart. Night was falling on the city. Thousands of stars lit up in the dark blue sky. The carriage drove quickly down the street, its wheels creaking. The servant told his lordship that they had arrived at the hotel. The duke looked tired. He was getting out of the carriage. And he said that along the way he got lost in useless thoughts. A horseman was rushing towards them at full gallop. He shouted from afar, addressing the duke. The guy soon got off the horse. He said that the woman who pawned the ring was found dead. Killian was amazed at how quickly events unfolded in this quiet town. The duke mounted his horse. The assistant asked his grace to wait, but the gentleman had already galloped away. The man reasoned out loud to himself. It was one of two things. Either the queen has something or there was an enemy within. And whatever it was, Rowena was in danger. A dilapidated villa where our heroine lived. The door creaked, and the exhausted girl entered the room. A little boy met her. He walked to his mother, yawning and asking where she had been. The woman insisted that she needed to talk to Harriet about something. Mother told Demian that they might soon have to leave here somewhere far away. The boy asked how far, and he was upset that this meant that he would no longer see Aunt Harriet, Lawrence, and Rosalind. The woman wanted to answer her son, but there was a knock on their door. She did not react, but they knocked insistently. Then she ordered her son to quickly go to his room. The boy asked a bunch of questions. Why? Who is at the door? But his mother reassured him that it must be the mistress. The boy agreed. The woman closed the door behind him. She reassured herself that it couldn't be Killian. What even if he divorced his wife, for the reason that she could not conceive? All he has to do is find another woman and get married. She convinced her that it couldn't be him, because he had no reason to look for her. Because he didn't love her. The door was opening, and a male silhouette appeared on the threshold. He addressed her as Miss Fallone. Rowena told herself that this couldn't happen. There was horror in her eyes. He said that he understood that for her, he was like a demon or a reaper of death. The woman was amazed. He examined her home. I wondered out loud what a miserable life she lived. Rowena asked why he was here and took a step back. Killian tiredly sat down on the nearest chair. He suggested that she start all over again. The woman said that the last time they saw each other, he threw money at her when he left her. The duke assured that he had not forgotten anything, that he threw her away and it was his job to get her back. He took out a lighter and lit a cigarette. Rowena was indignant and was again smoking in the room where her child lives. She demanded that he put out the cigarette now. A boy looked in the door. He called his mother. Through the crack, he saw that the guest did not look like the owner of the room, and he looked with curiosity at who came here. The duke was stunned. The mother ordered her son to go inside. Then she opened the front door and screamed at Killian to get out of here and out of her house. Her heart was beating fast in her chest. She didn't know if the duke had time to see Damien's face. And did he realize that the child was so much like him? The duke sat and laughed, holding his head. The chair creaked under him. He said that he did not expect more honesty from her, that he would never have thought she had baggage now. He said she must have met another man during their breakup. Rowena ordered him not to come close to her. The duke took another step closer to her, officially called her Miss Fallone, and he grabbed her chin with his hand. I asked when she became so impudent. The woman stammered that he was invading her home, and therefore he cannot expect kindness from her. He assumed it was because of that man and he brought his face closer to hers. Their tongues touched together. He licked her with an animalistic thirst to possess all of her. But the woman found the strength in herself and hit him, pushing him away from her. There was a mark on the duke's face. A man's hand slammed against the wall behind the woman. The duke asked Miss Fallone to make a choice. Tears flowed from her eyes. Killian offered her to become his lover or end up on the street with the child. The man asked the woman to make a choice. Tears flowed from her eyes. He offered her to become his lover or to end up on the street with the child. The woman pushed the man's shoulder away from her. She asked him why he was doing this after all these years. Rowena asked why he was so cruel to her. After all, he already left her once, and she asked what else he needed from her. She grabbed him by the tails of his jacket and shook him with anger. The Duke thought why she asked him about this. He himself would also like to know the reason why. Killian was about to leave after paying a woman named Harriet, and he believed that he did not need to waste time visiting Rowena. He was simply annoyed that his ex-woman lived in poverty. She was the woman who betrayed him and started an affair on the side. And now she was the mother of a child from another man. 
The Duke of Devonshire could not understand for himself why he still did not want to let her go from his hands. He began to feel sick. Tears flowed uncontrollably from the woman's eyes. Killian said he didn't need a reason. He did it simply because he wanted to. The Duke said that he would give her time to collect her things, and he will come for her tomorrow at noon. And when he returns, the child better be here too. I said goodbye to her and see you soon. When the man left, our heroine fell to the floor on her knees from powerlessness. Tears even dripped from her chin onto the floor. The back of her dress was clutched by her son's small hand. He called her quietly. Mom, are you okay? The woman turned to Damien. The son asked Rowena who was the man who had just left. She replied that it was her old friend. The boy began to question her, but the woman reminded him of their conversation about their move, that the man would like to help them, and they will live with him. She assured that he was very rich. Mother assured Demian that then he would be able to get all the candies and toys he wanted. From now on, but the boy interrupted her by shouting, No! He clenched his fists and assured her that he only wanted to be with her. The boy blamed the stranger for making his mother cry. Rowena looked at such a small but very adult son. There was a time when Killian Devonshire was everything to her. When he loved, and her love for him in return meant everything in the world to her. But the one who stopped her life from dying was the child that was growing inside her, not Killian. That the man killed her, but Demian brought her back to life. Rowena hugged her son, pressing his small head to her shoulder. She said that even if they lived with someone, he was all she had, the most precious thing in her life. The boy asked if it was true. Rowena confirmed this. She assured him that he was the only person she loved more than life itself. He was the only one. The next day, the woman showed up at work with a message that she was planning to leave. Her colleagues were surprised that she decided this so suddenly. The blonde admitted that she didn't even have anything to say to them. She bowed and asked them to forgive her that she could not stay here until they found a replacement for her, especially when everyone is still in shock from Anna's disappearance. The woman looked at each other. One of them said that they understood that she had urgent matters. The friend nodded, and they handed her a modest but delicate bouquet of roses. Colleagues said they prepared them for her, that she has worked honestly and hard until today, that they were sad that she was leaving so suddenly, and they were grateful that she decided to do something at work that no one else would undertake. Rebecca also thanked her colleagues that they had treated her so well for the past four years, and she asked excitedly how they knew that she was getting ready to leave. Then taking a step forward, Harriet left the service room. She assured that it was she who told all the women of their team about this. The blonde was surprised, and the manager furrowed her eyebrows. She grabbed Rowena by the hand and called and led her with her, assuring her that they had something to talk about in private. In an empty room, the woman admitted that she told the man where the blonde with green eyes lived, Rowena asked what she meant. The friend assured that she understood everything herself, that Duke Killian Devonshire was Demian's biological father. Rowena didn't know what to answer to this. The woman said that she was sorry that she could not fulfill her requests, and that she had every right to blame her. But she believed that Demian needed better living conditions and surroundings. She also insisted that she could confidently say that that man loved her. The blonde involuntarily shuddered at such words. Our heroine clenched her fist on her chest, she was sure that her friend thought she was doing the right thing. He didn't know what he did to her then, and she understood that Harriet cared for Demian like a son. The woman could not be offended by Harriet, but she didn't know that the Duke didn't love her, and she said that there was no need to apologize, that she had no other feelings for her except gratitude. Rowena said that she would have one last request for her. I asked if I could contact her one last time. She agreed, of course, and he asked what she wanted. The blonde asked if she could send this letter. The address belongs to a man named Jeremy Dish. Harriet remembered where she had heard this name. I asked if he was that famous author. Rowena confirmed this and said that he was her maternal uncle and the man who raised her when she was little. The blonde asked to let him know that she misses him a lot. And if everything is in order, write the address on the envelope yourself. The friend promised Rowena, of course, to do everything that way. She said that she prayed that her and Demian's life would be filled only with happiness from now on. The blonde nodded in response, smiling. Friends and colleagues at the factory said goodbye, waving to each other. When Rowena left, she thought that they would not let her go as before. She needed to protect Damien. If the Duke finds out that he is the boy's father, he will not leave her alone. She imagined how her son Damien would remain in a vast, neglected castle, where no one would be near him. Rowena thought she needed to escape. Even before the irreparable happens, it doesn't matter what it is. The woman's body lay in an unnatural position. The man said that she was poisoned, and judging by the bloody marks on her upper lip, it looks like she was struggling before she swallowed the poison. That, 
Based on all the evidence available, the culprit was a stranger to her. And right now, the only suspect is the man she lived with, who was seen running away together. That this man will also soon be found dead. He asked the magistrate to be told that an unknown man had left the woman's body in front of the medical examiner's office. The Duke understood that someone was targeting Rowena Falone, and he acted very insidiously. Apparently, they had to kill Anna Eden to give a warning, and this is not what the Queen wanted. Killian smoked a cigarette and thought. It turned out that in this case, the only suspect he could think of was his aunt. The right hand told the master that Mr. Zenok went after Miss Fallone, and they will soon arrive at the train station. The Duke specified that the child should also be there. The blonde said that Mr. Zenok had booked a separate cabin for the boy. Killian asked that the child be kept out of his sight. The Duke put out his cigarette with the toe of his shoe. He suddenly remembered his conversation with Rowena yesterday, that she reminded him of how he threw money at her when he abandoned her. Killian's head began to throb again. He grabbed his face and forehead with his hand, holding back a cry of pain. The events of the next day unfolded rapidly. Rowena stood and was met by a man in a jacket she already knew. He told Miss Fallone that it was a long time ago. She swallowed the lump in her throat. She recognized Mr. Zenok. The man raised his hat in greeting and nodded his head. He said that the carriage was ready and asked her to go with him. He said that his honor was already waiting. The woman asked if she could go to the house and pick up her packed luggage, but Mr. Zenok shook his head and said that the Duke wants her to leave everything behind, except for these clothes that she is wearing now. Rowena said to herself that he knew. After all, he always did everything his own way, and again she felt like a victim of the will of the man she hated. Mr. said that anyone could tell that Damien was the Duke's child, that when he saw it himself, he was simply shocked. Rowena asked where Damien is now, and she demanded to say that nothing happened to him. The man insisted that he thought it would be better for his grace to judge for himself, and he hasn't told him anything yet. He said that the young master was safe, and he had prepared all the conditions for his residence. The woman demanded that she wanted to see everything with her own eyes. The man asked Miss Fallone to calm down, and he promised her that her child would be fine. Rowena asked how she could trust him. After all, she knew that the child was illegitimate. He was the boy who could sabotage the Devonir family tree. And as an employee in the house, Zanok will never accept the boy properly. But he assured the woman that she could trust him, that the Duke's son is his young master. Therefore, this made him the one he was meant to serve. He handed Rowena an envelope. I asked him to take it. He assured that this would cover their travel expenses. He assured that he would not tell the Duke about this. Our heroine thought that five years ago, when everyone looked down on her because she was a mistress. Zinok Gleiters was the only person who treated her well. The woman decided for some time whether it was worth taking that envelope. Then she announced that she had one request. She asked him not to tell the Duke that Demian was his son. The man did not understand why there were such difficulties, and I was sure that if this was left a secret, it would not lead to anything good. Rowena insisted that she wanted to tell him about it herself when she was ready. Zinok thought to himself that five years ago, he had imagined Rowena Falone to be nothing more than a beautiful doll to satisfy the Duke's desires. And now she had a different look. She was a determined and strong-willed woman with a steely character. The man said that he could not give her much time, and I was sure that the truth would come out sooner or later. He turned to leave. The woman sighed with relief. Gleiters said over his shoulder that he would allow her to see her son for a while, and he said that he would make sure that the employees were silent about this. Further events take us to the station of that town with factories. The train stood on the platform waiting for passengers. The boy, dressed in a new bright blue suit that so opportunely emphasized his eye color, joyfully greeted his mother. The woman greeted her son. He then jumped into her arms. After the hugs, the baby began to show off his new clothes. He reported that he was told that it was all for him, and he pointed his finger at the books, the soft bear, the railroad, the boat, and the sweets on the table. He also showed off his clothes. He asked how his mother thought, whether this was suitable for him. Rowena affectionately replied that it suited him very well, and she herself thought that this child was deprived of many things that he wanted, and she couldn't imagine how hard it was for him to give up his childhood desires. The kid asked his mother, Is it right that he accepts all this? Rowena kissed her son on the forehead and assured him that of course it was right and thanked him for being so kind. He giggled and said it was ticklish. Mr. Zenok coughed, indicating his presence and time. He called out the woman's name. Rowena told her son that she had to go now. The boy clarified that she was going to that person. She confirmed, and she assured him that she would simply be in another cabin, that he would see her when they got off the train and asked her not to worry about this in vain. But the boy firmly said, no. He said that he didn't want my mother to go to that man, that he scares him, and that he feels that the man wants to take his mother away from him. 
Rowena looked at her son and almost cried. Our heroine told herself that she must remain strong, that she needed to remain in Killian's good graces for now. Demian grabbed his mother around the waist and did not let her go. Mr. Zenuk asked the nanny to keep an eye on the boy. The nanny asked the young master to calm down. She said that she would prepare him a delicious snack, but the boy struggled. He screamed to be released immediately. He shouted that he didn't need toys or clothes. He stated that he needed his mother, but Rowena took a decisive step out of the compartment and the door latched behind her. Ravina once again checked with Mr. Zenoc Glitters that he would take care of her son Demian. He said, of course, she nodded in response. With every step along the corridor, our heroine's heart beat faster. With every step she felt her execution approaching. She felt that a noose around her neck was already waiting for her. Mr. Zenoc knocked on his grace the Duke's compartment. The door opened with a creak. The woman was completely exhausted from nervous tension. Glitters informed the gentleman that Miss Fallone was here. Killian sat and read a newspaper with news through his glasses. Taking his eyes off his reading, he asked Miss Fallone to pass. Our heroine took another step. To him, the hated one who trampled all her feelings and her life. When the servant left, slamming the door of the compartment, Rowena sat down on the opposite seat in the corner away from the Duke. She looked at the floor. Killian asked the woman if this was a sign of her protest. She answered, no, of course, that she just didn't want to disturb him, sitting too close. The Duke believed that she overestimated herself. He assured that she did not have such an influence on him. He took off his glasses. He said that there was one thing for which he should praise her. He was glad that she didn't take that little guy with her, that he wasn't sure if she could do it. Rowena shuddered nervously. She clenched her fists and asked his permission to ask something. What if she had no influence on him? Then why look for her? The Duke looked at Rowena coldly. She kept asking why he broke into her house. It was strange to her that this was all just to bring her and her son back to Rockford, although they lived peacefully here too. A sharp bang sounded next to the woman's head. Killian stood next to her in a threatening position. He told her that he just wanted his trash back. Rowena was shaking all over. She told herself that there was no need to be afraid, that she, as a mother, should have protected Damien. She asked blatantly when he would be kind enough to throw her away again. Rowena asked the Duke when he would stop controlling her life. He roughly grabbed her chin, but then he started kissing her on the lips. He kissed and licked her. I asked him to stop being so provocative. He stroked his ear gently. Then he looked at her coldly and asked Miss Fallone to keep her mouth shut. The woman wiped her face with the back of her hand. She said that if he was not going to answer her, then she asked his permission for her to go to bed. Rowena claimed that she had so many thoughts last night that she simply could not sleep. And now I felt tired and overwhelmed. Killian thought it was simply incredible and allowed her to do as she wanted. The woman was preparing the shelf for bed, covering it with linen. Soon, having rustled a little, Rowena had already settled down to rest, turning her face to the wall. The Duke sat and quietly watched her. The girl dreamed that she was young and with a suitcase in her hands. Uncle Jeremy runs to her, waves his hand and calls. Running up to her, he was panting from his fast run, and he asked the girl to wait a second. He asked if she really needed to leave. He assured that she didn't even know what she would encounter in the capital, that an innocent and naive girl like her can easily be used for one's own purposes. Rowena thanked Uncle Jeremy for his concern. She assured that she had a friend who lived in the capital, so he should not worry about her. She said that she was no longer a child. The girl said that she wants to experience new things and achieve her dream on her own. The man told Rowena that if she wanted it, he would give her his blessing. He said he couldn't force her to stay here, but he asked me to promise him one thing. He put his hand on her shoulder. What if she needs help or has problems so she can come home? And it didn't matter to him when or what she did. Then Jeremy Dish gave such admonishments a long time ago and promised his help. He told Rowena that he would always be on her side. The girl called Uncle Jeremy, but she was surrounded by men. One pointed his finger at her and ordered him to catch her. Rowena wondered why she didn't ask Uncle Jeremy for help then, and she had to run away. When her friend betrayed her and left the dead in her name, when Killian left her and left, when was Demian born? There were so many opportunities to connect with my uncle, but she ran away and decided everything herself. But she never doubted, but knew for sure that he was on her side. Rowena just didn't want him to see that she failed and couldn't take care of herself, and he was like a father to her. It is true that her foolish pride was the cause of all her misfortunes, but now she had to protect her son Damien. She mentally, with her little son in her arms, asked Uncle Jeremy to help her. She begged to be saved from all this, which was happening not according to her will, but in spite of her. 
The train was traveling across a railway bridge through mountainous terrain, taking its passengers into the distance. Rowena blinked and woke up from her sleep. Duke Killian slept nearby and hugged her in his sleep. She quietly asked him if he was sleeping. He asked her in a whisper to stay in place, that if he fidgets it might excite him. Five years ago, when they got intimate, Killian always left immediately after, saying that he was very busy. And now Rowena wondered why he was doing this now, after all these years. But without solving the puzzle, I decided that it didn't matter. And there's no point in thinking about it. She suggested just going back to sleep. She wanted to forget about everything for today. And the train kept rushing into the distance. After some time, they arrived at the Devonshire estate. The old butler came out to meet the gentleman. He was glad that he returned from his long journey. He was telling Killian that the maids had prepared Miss Fallone's old room. The duke ordered Rowena to be given a room next to his. The servant argued with his lordship. He said that this was the room for the duchess. Killian retorted that she wasn't busy right now anyway. Rowena listened to all this quietly. She thought that if her room was next to his, it would be more difficult for her to see Damien, which was not in her best interest. She raised her voice and intervened in the ensuing argument, and she told his lordship that she preferred her old room. The duke frowned, and he said that Miss Fallone would use the room next to his private one. Cleon turned and walked away, making it clear that the conversation was over. A one-story, well-kept, good-quality house in the countryside. There was persistent knocking on the door. A young voice announced that the mail had arrived. A mature man in glasses appeared on the threshold, yawning and scratching his head. He said that the postman could leave letters in front of the door. The young boy said that he had to give him something personally, and he quickly rummaged through his shoulder bag. The man held an envelope in his hands, said that it was a publishing company that was trying to speed up his work, and asked to send it back. Soon the man threw and threw the remaining letters in different directions, one after another. The guy asked him to come to his senses, but one letter stopped his impulse. On it he read, Harriet Dickinson. Jeremy picked up this letter with interest and began to turn it over, looking at it. Zinnock saw the blonde off, carrying a candle in front of her. He reported that the Duke planned to leave the mansion at dawn for several days, that he has questions about taxes and property management. He said that at this time, it would be easier for Rowena to see the young master. She asked if any of the workers had seen Demian. Zinnock replied that not many had seen the boy, including him and the nanny, but they all swore to silence, so he assured her that she didn't need to worry. The door to the room creaked. There, on a large bed, a boy was fast asleep, hugging a teddy bear. The woman enjoyed his sleepy snoring. The servant quietly told her that the duke had no children from his previous marriage, and if the duke recognizes the boy as his biological son, then there is a high probability that he will be recognized as his heir. But the woman doubted that her son would grow up as a duke in this isolated castle. Mr. Zinnock told Miss that every child has the right to know who his real father is, and the duke must know about the existence of his son. That one way or another he deserved it. He asked her to tell her little by little about the young master, and when his grace stops avoiding Demian, she will be able to reveal the whole truth to the duke. Rowena was sad. She mentally asked Zenoch for forgiveness for the fact that this would never happen. After all, she was planning to escape before this even happened. She quietly stroked her sleeping son's head. The next day turned out to be clear and sunny. There was a blue sky above the Duke of Devonshire's castle. The maid smiled and wished Miss Fallone good morning. She introduced herself as Joanna Jude. She said that she was her personal maid, and she asked me to simply call her Joanne. The blonde with a smile on her face said that she was pleased to meet Joanna. By the way, she asked if she knew a girl named Melissa. She said that she used to work here, the last time she was here. She described her as brown-haired with brown eyes and freckles. The girl said that this one left soon after she herself got here, and that she heard that that maid received a large allowance and returned to her hometown. Now she worked on her parents' farm. Rowena said that what she heard was a relief. She said Melissa took care of her then, and she asked that if Joanna ever writes, she should send a greeting from her too. The maid promised, and suddenly I remembered that I had to show her something. A question froze on our heroine's face, and Joanna was pushing the door into the next room. It opened with a creak. On the floor were many boxes and gift bags from various shops and boutiques in that city. Rowena froze in a stupor. She asked the maid what all this was about. Joanna laughingly explained that these were gifts for Miss. After all, the whole capital knew that she had returned. There were shoes from the house of the Earl of Wales, and a pearl necklace from Baroness Somerset, and a dress from a famous boutique, and something else. And Rowena reflected that five years ago, these same nobles called her dirty and looked at her with disgust. 
and now they sent her cards and expensive gifts, and they thought that she was now in a better position than she was before. She chuckled imperceptibly. They believed that even if she did not become a duchess, she would definitely be an influential figure in the House of Devonshire. She thought it was sad that when the Duke got tired of her, he would throw her away again. Rowena ordered the maid to send everything back. The girl was surprised and sad and depressed. But then Joanna suddenly remembered that there was one letter that arrived without gifts, from someone named Harriet Dickinson. Rowena's eyes widened. She asked him to leave him here, and she said that she was going to read it separately a little later. When the maid went to run errands, Rowena opened the envelope and began to take out its contents. With a rustle, she unfolded the paper enclosed in the envelope. Dear Rowena, how are you? The twins miss Demian terribly, and I miss you too. Our heroine almost cried with emotion. I heard that you are looking for a tutor for Demian. I'm also worried about the twins' education. It's so difficult to find a teacher who can teach two people at once. Rowena thought about the tutor too. Anything could have happened. I heard one of your favorite writers lives in your area. He's a friend of a friend of mine. So I asked him and he says he's looking for a job because he doesn't make enough money from his jobs. What do you think about hiring him as Demian's teacher? The woman began to look for the book by Roderick Defonce. She soon found the publication she was looking for and opened it. Rowena began leafing through that book. It was another letter from her uncle that only she knew about. That book was signed by the author, to my beloved and only niece, Roderick Defonce. In Killian's absence, the woman was able to see her son much more often. But Demian's place in this house was rather ambiguous. He was the landlady's child, not biologically related to the Duke. The boy was locked in his room and could hardly go anywhere else. He often looked out at the world around him through the window of his room. When Rowena entered the child's room, he looked up from contemplating the window and began asking his mother if she had ever been to the lake in front of the castle. She answered, a little confused, that she had been there several times. Demian asked if he could also visit him with her this time. He promised that everything would be fine. Rowena realized that her son understood that he did not have much freedom here. But this little child wanted to see the world around him freely. She answered him that they could go there for a while. Our heroine walked along the garden path looking around. The baby happily stomped next to his mother by the hand. Rowena reassured herself that everything should be okay. That it was only dawn, and she put the hat on her son. It was a beautiful sight on the lake. The woman and the boy enjoyed the smooth blue of the pond and the mirror reflection of nature in its waters. Rowena asked herself, wondering if this lake had always been so beautiful. The sun rose over the mountain, giving the first rays of the mirror-like surface of the water. She remembered that when she was the Duke's lover, she came here several times with him. But then it was a small and unattractive lake. The woman saw much cleaner lakes in the country, and she was amazed at how beautiful it could be when she looked at it with her child. Damien screamed and jumped for joy. He said he was so excited he couldn't help himself. His mother had fun with him. The boy said that he liked that it was just the two of them here. He said that he would like to swim, but he himself understood that he couldn't. Rowena told him that soon he would be able to swim wherever he wanted. She said that her maternal uncle should come to them soon, that his name is Jeremy Dish. The boy asked if it was true, and he asked if they could leave here. The mother promised her son this by offering him her little finger. Rowena and Damien made a promise by crossing their little fingers. Rowena told the boy that he would swim in larger lakes with much more freedom. It was already early morning when Rowena and her son returned to the castle. She walked him to the door of his room and waved him goodbye. Our heroine walked along the corridor and thought that when Killian returned, she would have to ask him, will she be able to hire a mentor teacher for Demian? After all, no one except her knew him as Roderick Defonce, so everything should have been in order. The door creaked. The blonde carefully entered the room. The duke called out to her. He asked her where she was at such a late hour. The woman said that she went out for a walk. She reported that she felt that she was suffocating and went out into the fresh air. The duke reproached her for not telling anyone about this. Rowena insisted that she was sorry and promised that this would not happen again. She asked how long ago he returned from his trip. Killian said the last thing she needed right now was to worry about something like that. The woman was wringing her hands. When they lay down on the bed, the duke kept thinking that Rowena had become so thin. Over the past five years, he felt as if he had a hole in his chest. Although later he realized that Rowena did not take the money he gave her, he had no intention of looking for her to give them to her. The duke, thinking about Rowena's affair, was so upset that if he saw her again he might not be able to resist strangling her to death. But when he met Rowena Falone again, he felt not anger at all. The emotion he felt was so complex that it couldn't be simply described as sympathy or tenderness. That if she lived a good life, then he wouldn't feel that way about her. But now there was no point in thinking about it. 
The Duke himself needed her. He thought that he had left her behind forever, but that was far from the truth. And the only thing that bothered him was his little son, to whom his woman was so attached. The man addressed Rowena. He told her that he had decided to leave everything in the past. She asked what he meant. Killian said he could see the baby, and he can go for a walk around the castle if he wants, but only with a security guard at a certain time. The woman asked if he was sure. He asked that she really thought that he did not know that she went to see her son while he was not here. He said that as long as he didn't catch his eye, everything was fine. Killian said that tomorrow he was going to set up a trust fund for her, and all she has to do is listen to the lawyer and sign the papers. He said that from now on, if he needed anything, she should talk to him directly or through the maid. Rowena wondered why he suddenly became so generous. She insisted that she didn't need a trust fund, that he already does enough for her. The Duke admitted that he needed her, and he said that he didn't know that she liked lakes. He promised that as soon as everything calmed down, he would go boating with her. The weather was clear. They were boating on the lake. The Duke kept his earlier promise. They rowed around the lake in a boat. Killian sat on the oars. Between their benches there was a table with snacks. Rowena munched on a chocolate brownie with berry decorations. Her face was a little stained with chocolate from the sweets. Moreover, now the Duke dined with Rowena every day, but he didn't force her to sleep with him in exchange for his generosity. The woman could not understand what he was thinking about. She admitted to herself that she took great pleasure in looking at what was going on in his head. Killian reached out and brushed the crumbs of the chocolate sweet from her face. Rowena turned away and quickly licked her lips. The Duke said that a gift was waiting for her at home, but she believed that he had given her enough, and she insisted that she would prefer permission to see Demian more often. The man began to get irritated. The very name of this child from another man infuriated him. He said that in his opinion he had already given her enough freedom. Rowena said that he allowed her to see her son only at the appointed time. She believed that the child was still small, and needed the care of his mother. He asked her wishes to be with her son all day. The Duke said that the child had two nannies and a team of servants at his disposal at any time of the day. But Rowena said that she, like his mother, was the only one who truly cared about the boy. She said that this little child helped her survive the most difficult moment of her life when she wanted to commit suicide. And when he first screamed, when he took his first steps, although he was falling, the first time he called her mom and ran into her arms, these were the moments that made her the happiest, although she did not even hope for it. Rowena admitted that her son meant everything to her. The woman was crying. She said that her son was the only ray of hope that supported her in this life. Killian was shocked. His head was throbbing again. He gently wiped away Rowena's tears. He asked her to calm down. He smacked his forehead. And the woman pressed herself against him, accepting his comforting embrace. The woman felt his warmth. But she told herself that she shouldn't let his warmth fool her. She knew that a man could switch in a second, depending on his mood. She remembered that he dragged her to the very bottom when she was the happiest. Therefore, I considered his warmth simply a whim. She thought that if she behaved well, then she would use it to her advantage. Rowena asked if he would allow her to see her child more often. The Duke wiped her tears from his face, and he promised to think about it. In the meantime, they were returning to the castle, where a gift was waiting for her. The blonde was sitting on a soft sofa. She wondered what kind of gift awaited her. Lately the Duke had been giving her something almost every day. Jewels, dresses, flowers. Door opened. The woman came and said hello to Miss Rowena. It was Melissa. The woman was surprised. She realized that it was Killian who was talking about this gift. When asked how she ended up here, she replied that she was hired again, so she will help Joanna look after her. The maid said that she was very glad to be back. The blonde rushed to hug the maid. She couldn't even express how glad she was to see Melissa. Rowena said she was told that Melissa had returned to her hometown, and she assured that her appearance was a pleasant surprise for her. She said that she was happy that she was here. She asked whether Melissa was forced to return against her will. She admitted that she even told Joanna how much she missed her. The maid remembered how the man with the mustache spoke, that all she would have to do is say one thing, that Miss Fallone was having an affair with William Zeno. Then she asked the master that she couldn't do this anymore, and he asked her why she was trying to escape now, after everything she had done. That with his help, she perfectly played the role of the ideal maid. He reminded her that her father was crippled, her mother was sick, and her older brothers were just in the prime of life. Melissa sat on the soft carriage seat. She reassured herself that everything would be fine with Miss Filona. After all, she was the Duke's mistress, and she selflessly repeated this to herself whenever she felt guilty. Everything was like that until... After five years, she received a letter from Joanna. The woman handed over the envelope. 
and said that it was from some Joanna. Melissa read, The first thing that caught my eye was her unhealthy paleness and thinness. It was hard for me to believe that five years ago she was considered an absolute beauty, and I also heard that she has a child. The girl covered her face, but her eyes expressed horror. She told herself that it was all her fault. After all, if she hadn't lied then. She remembered that interrogation, and afterwards how Rowena had been sincere and kind with her. Melissa was brought out of her stupor by Rowena's voice. She shook her by the shoulders. When she came to her senses, the blonde asked her if everything was okay with her, and she turned blue all over. The maid realized with bitterness that Miss Rowena was still kind to her, and it looked like she didn't know anything about what happened five years ago. And why was she treated so cruelly? Melissa decided that she had to tell the whole truth and beg for forgiveness. The girl began to say with her fists clenched with determination that she had to tell Miss Rowena something. But then they were interrupted. The man said that he had not seen Miss Fallone for a long time. It was Baron Sussex. Rowena greeted him and asked how she could help him. The man insisted that he had just spoken with a lawyer, and now he needed to discuss trust funds with her. Melissa looked at the Baron in horror. Rowena noticed this and asked the maid why this suddenly happened to her. The girl assured her that she was a little unwell and asked forgiveness for that. Miss Fallone assumed that her maid was simply exhausted from the long journey, so she suggested that she go and rest. I said goodbye to her until tomorrow. Melissa thanked, apologized, and said goodbye. Rowena was seriously worried about the girl. The maid stepped aside and stood by the window, gathering her strength. Tears flowed uncontrollably from her eyes. At some point, her strength left her, and she sat down straight on the floor. She considered herself simply disgusting, that she doesn't deserve forgiveness after what she did. Melissa asked herself what she should do now. After all, she couldn't even look Rowena in the eye. Then a man approached her. He ordered the maid to get up. She wanted to say something, but began to stutter terribly. Zanuck ordered her to go. He said that his lordship wanted to see her. The man said that they would continue as agreed. Rowena thanked him. He said that words of gratitude were not worth it. There were written business papers on the table. The baron said that if she still had any questions, she should ask him them without hesitation. The woman was sure that he already had enough to do, and he shouldn't worry about her so much. The middle-aged man said that Rowena was very important to the duke that it was even kind of charming. He remembered that she was first expelled and then returned. And now the Duke also wanted to open an account in her name. He was amazed at how changeable this world is. The woman just smiled shyly back at him. The Baron turned to Miss Fallone and extended his hand to her. He asked her if she would accompany him on a walk if it was not difficult for her. And soon he showed her the portrait of Lady Hearse on the wall. He said about the lady in the picture that she was the Duke's great aunt. Rowena thought she was beautiful and the Baron assured her that everyone in the Devonshire family always stood out for their appearance. He said that Lady Hersey left this world at about the age that Miss Fallone was now in it. He said that she married a powerful duke from another kingdom, that he fell in love with her at first sight when he found himself in Easelwood on business, but she didn't want to marry him. They said that she already had a loved one. Therefore, not even a year had passed since her wedding when she hanged herself. It was only much later that the truth emerged. At the time she was forced to marry the duke, she was pregnant with her lover's child. Then Lady Hersey had a miscarriage, and her man was quietly and quickly executed. The Baron said that Rowena could imagine the rest herself. The man told the woman about Earl William, that he was not the closest relative, but he was always close to the family, and he died at the hands of his mistress. And Lady Elizabeth was supposed to marry a man from the imperial family, but she fell in love with a commoner and jumped off a cliff. The Baron said that the past Duke of Devonshire was the father of his lordship, that he died because of a terrible event related to his favorite, the actress with whom he lived at the time. Sese concluded that all those people died due to tragic events related to love. He asked if Rowena knew where his lordship's middle name Maximilian came from. He said that it was at the suggestion of his father's favorite, and therefore his lordship never recognized this name. The Baron asked her to just think about how she could give her son the name of her favorite. But if you looked at the history of the Devonshire house, then everything became clear. It was clear that their entire family was under a curse. People from the Devonshire family were capable of falling in love only once in their lives. The man brought the woman with the painting covered with canvas and held a flashlight nearby. He asked Rowena what she thought was who was in this picture. It was his lordship's late fiancé. He was betrothed to her before he was born. The Baron pulled off the canvas, revealing the face in that portrait. The cup fell to the floor and shattered into pieces. Melissa was alarmed. She asked Miss if she was hurt, but she assured that everything was fine. The Baron said that he only wants one thing, 
to make his lordship happy. That's why he showed her this portrait. I believe that relationships cannot be built on deception. The man looked straight into Rowena's eyes. He expressed the hope that she understood at least a little of the truth. Rowena sat on the edge of the bed. She asked Melissa to bring her sleeping pills. She said that somehow she couldn't sleep at all. The maid was surprised. She said that she had been here for a whole week, and the lady took sleeping pills almost every day. The woman said that this was true and expressed hope that the duke would return soon. Joanna said that it's not easy for the lady, and then the gentleman also left somewhere. Melissa chimed in. Rowena was worried about Melissa, whether everything was okay with her. Distant stars were shining through the window. Our heroine was sleeping peacefully in bed. At some point, a man's hand began to remove her golden hair from her face and ear. The woman woke up from this, and I saw his grace Duke Killian nearby. He looked at her thoughtfully. He apologized for waking her up, but Rowena told herself that she would not allow herself to be fooled by him again. But no matter how many times she told herself this, some part of her wanted to believe otherwise. But now, after that picture, everything fell into place. She found out why Killian decided to return to her after what happened. She believed that he was attracted by the shell of a woman whom he had long loved. She turned to Killian. That while he was gone, she thought about how she really felt. She crossed her fingers with his. She said that she realized that these five years that she lived without him were full of bitterness and sadness. The Duke told Rowena that he missed her so much. They hugged tenderly. And from that day on, their tenuous relationship turned into something completely different. Rowena openly admitted defeat, and Killian in turn became gentle and generous as never before. Every night they went to bed together, and in the mornings, freshly cut flowers waited next to her bed. Every day famous jewelers and tailors came to the Duke's estate, and Rowena's beauty blossomed again, like a flower in spring. At the masquerade ball, our heroine appeared in a snow-white dress with embroidery and the Duke's scarlet jewelry. The aristocracy whispered. They said it was Miss Fallone. They admired how beautiful she was, that she is exactly the same as she was five years ago. Others said that she became even more beautiful. Killian asked his date to dance. They were in the very center of everyone's attention. But the couple danced without paying attention to anyone. They were simply enjoying each other's company. And the whole world ceased to exist for them. The maids whispered quietly. It seemed to Joanna that Miss Fallone had undergone an extraordinary transformation lately and it seemed that she and the Duke had become closer. She hoped that at this rate, Rowena would soon become Duchess of Devonshire, and Joanna herself will become the Duchess's maid. The girls laughed. Melissa knew that Joanna came here after that situation. That's why I didn't know what happened between the Duke and Rowena at that time. But she was also glad that everything worked out between the lady and the Duke, but you can't erase the words from the song. Miss Fallone called Melissa and waved to her. Rowena approached the maids. She said that she had already searched them. She asked Miss what happened. Miss called to go with her to the terrace to get some air. Melissa took Rowena out into the fresh air. She assumed that she had drunk a little. I asked if she was dizzy. The woman assured that she was fine. The maid felt that it was getting cold and volunteered to bring Miss Rowena a cloak. The blonde thanked her for her concern. She also remembered that the maid then wanted to tell her something. Melissa made her eyes wide in surprise and said that she didn't understand what she was talking about. Rowena reminded her that she wanted to tell her something but then Baron Sussex prevented them. Melissa sighed and insisted that she just wanted to say that she always really wanted to meet her again. The maid said that she would return immediately with a cloak, and she quickly ran away to get some warm clothes for Rowena. When the woman was left alone, she thought, but someone came up from behind her and touched her shoulder. The man gently kissed her bare back. It was his grace Duke Killian. Rowena told him that he dressed like a vampire today. He said that it was a spontaneous decision, and he needed her shoulders. The man brought his teeth to Miss Fallone's neck, ready to bite her. She jokingly asked if he would let her go when he drank all her blood. He answered, No way. The woman had already seriously addressed his lordship. She said that she had one request for him. She voiced that she would like Damien to have a teacher. The duke began to smoothly unfasten the zipper on Rowena's dress. The woman continued to think that her erudition was not enough to teach her son herself. The man said he could do it. But she said that she had one person in mind. She had one mutual friend with him, and she would like to recommend him. The Duke clarified whether it was a man or a woman. Killian continued to undo the clasp on his dress. The woman gasped, and she asked his lordship to stop. After all, Melissa could be returning here at any moment. The Duke asked how she knew that teacher. She replied that he was one of her favorite writers. That's why she thought that he could teach Demian. Killian asked for the man's name. The blonde said Roderick Defonce. There were five cards of the suit of spades on the green playing table. Royal straight flush, 
said the young blonde, smiling. He asked the company if they would play again. One of his guests refused, assuring that at this rate he would remain penniless. Another also said that he had enough. The guy said goodbye to them until next time, and he waved his hand cheerfully after them. Then he turned to the Duke and asked what he would say to that, and he invited him to play again. Killian smoked a cigarette in thought, blowing clouds of tobacco smoke around him. After a pause, he said that he should first get rid of the fraudulent deck of cards secured under the table. The blonde asked how he knew everything, and he agreed to return the money he won to the Duke, handing him a bundle of banknotes. Killian assured that he could keep the money for himself, claiming that he doesn't care about money at all. The guy asked what was the matter then. After all, as a rule, he never stayed late. The Duke put out his cigarette. He said that he just suddenly wanted it, and he sat down to read the newspaper. The guy also began to look at the newspaper. The headlines were that Glitter's trading was boasting of sudden growth, and shareholders were in huge profit. The blonde slyly said that now it was clear where the Duke had such an attitude towards money, and he assumed that he was in seventh heaven, Mr. Gray Eminence of Glitter's trading. A small company that originated somewhere in a small southern port now controlled all sea traffic passing through Easelwood, and it was not surprising that Killian Devonshire chose this particular port to start his business. After all, it was in this isolated place, washed by cruel waters, that there was also an underground network that had vital connections with other countries. The process of reorganization of this network, under the leadership of Killian, could hardly be called anything other than a little war. He justified his stay there by the desire to visit his wife's homeland. Meanwhile, he himself repeatedly visited this southern port in order to personally monitor the course of the war. And the situation reached its zenith when Killian put the squeeze on a large organization that refused to surrender. The gray-haired man was ordered to give them a sheet of names and was then promised to spare his life. But the man said that his interlocutor was Killian Devonshire, that he had heard a lot about him. What they say about him is that his mother was an actress and that she slept with everyone she met, that she carried him for the sake of his dad because his wife was infertile. The man thought that if he handed over a list of names, nothing would be done to him. The Duke was surprised that the one kneeling in front of him turned out to be so funny. Killian added that despite this, he had already become bored with him. A shot sounded and a pound went right through the skull. The Duke of Devonshire stood with a smoking pistol in his hands and smiled, pleased with himself. There was the blood of the murdered man on his face. He told him to come up with a more interesting insult in his next life. The guy with the banknotes in his hands knew that the Duke of Devonshire was never shy about getting his hands dirty. And now he was here in the playroom, such a gentleman in a suit, and Killian sat peacefully reading the newspaper. The blonde looked at his guest with interest, and he thought that he even looked somehow softer, and he attributed this to the fact that Rowena Falone was to blame. The Duke finally voiced his request. He asked to find out if there was any courtesan with the name or pseudonym Rowena Falone. The blonde said that eight years ago she surfaced briefly, and maybe he's still doing the same thing. He asked if that was the name of the Duke's favorite, and he clarified that he was looking for a courtesan with the same name. Killian answered in the affirmative, adding that he would be grateful for any information about her. The Duke assured the guy that if he did his job well, he would receive three times more money than he was currently holding in his hands. Our hero returned home late at night. He walked to his bedroom door, but it was too quiet. He even looked through the keyhole. The man decided that she was in another room. Rowena slept quietly and soundly in bed, suspecting nothing. Killian sat down on the edge of her bed. He was sad that the woman had gone to bed again, but he told her to go to bed in his bedroom. He gently and quietly called her name then leaned over and began to kiss her sleeping form. The woman, wheezing and grumbling in her sleep, turned over to the other side. The Duke decided that he would let her sleep peacefully for one night. But in her sleep, she said, Don't leave. The man froze in place. Mom, Dad, don't leave me. Rowena called again in her sleep. Her face was wet with tears. Killian quietly walked over to the bed and covered her eyes with his hand. He quietly told her that everything would be fine with her now, that he would do everything for her so that she would never cry again. A cart loaded with hay was driving along the road, and a dozing man was riding on the hay, covering his face with a hat and chewing a green leaf. The cart creaked to a stop in front of the gate to the Devonshire mansion. The driver asked if his passenger was sure that he definitely needed to get here. The man climbed down from the cart. He said that he was absolutely sure of that, and he thanked them for giving him a ride. When the cart left, the guest began to look up at the mansion and its vast territory. Through the bars of the gate, one could see the central path that led to the main entrance to the Duke's mansion. He told himself that this was the house in which this immoral man was holding his dear niece. 
When the man entered the hall, he was greeted by a blonde man in a strict gray suit. He greeted Mr. Roderick Defonce, clarifying that it was him. The blonde said that he was glad to meet you and introduced himself, that his name is Jenok. He reported that he was the Duke's personal secretary. Roderick said that his interlocutor's diligence ran ahead of him, and he is just an average writer, and he already knew his name. The blonde said that he could not notice that the guest arrived in a carriage, and he remembered that they had sent a carriage for him. The writer assured that he did not really like to ride in expensive carriages because of the cramped conditions. Jenok was surprised, and he said that if he had warned them in advance, proper measures would have been taken. He apologized about this, and turning his gaze to the suitcase, he asked if this was all. The writer confirmed this. The Duke's secretary asked the guest to follow him. He led Roderick down the hallway of the mansion, opening one of the many doors, he said, that for the time that he will be here, this will become his room. The decoration was exquisite and expensive. It was a bright and spacious room with soft furniture. Jenok told the guest that he would have to discuss the details with Miss Filone, that the contract with him was concluded for six months, but it could be that it will be extended if necessary. That free time from classes is extremely free, and the writer is free to spend it at his own discretion. But he should have remembered that everything that happens in this house should stay here. Meanwhile, Roderick spread the blanket and lay down on the bed. He joyfully said that he only had one life, and he wasn't going to risk her by spreading gossip around the city. The blonde succinctly said that he was glad that they understood each other correctly. By the way, he said that he thought that hiring such an outstanding person would not be easy, and he was grateful that he agreed to this job. Roderick replied that writers are people too, and he just wanted to earn some money. He asked when he could see Miss Phil, Philia, but he didn't remember the lady's name. The secretary corrected him, Miss Philone, and he informed the guest that the bath was already ready for him, and after that he promised to take him to Miss Philone. The writer cheerfully thanked, and he answered that he would leave for now, but would return soon and left, closing the doors behind him. Already at the door, Jenuk thought that this Rosrick Difons was a rare piece of trash. He saw right through such money-hungry bastards. And I was going to tell his lordship that there was nothing to worry about. The woman was sitting on a soft sofa. His lordship's secretary stood behind her introducing Roderick Defonce to her. She replied that it was an honor for her to see him in person. The man also politely replied that he was also glad to meet you. He also heard that Miss was an avid reader of his works. The blonde, embarrassed, insisted that she had read all his books and they are her favorite. The writer assured that she was too kind. Well, of course he realized that only masterpieces came from his pen, but Jenok listened to all this and realized that this conversation would drag on for a long time. He modestly said that he had to go on business. He asked for forgiveness that he had to leave them alone. Rowena let him go, smiling. When the secretary left, the woman and the writer began to communicate in sign language. They greeted each other joyfully. He said that on his way to the capital, he heard a huge number of different rumors, and he asked what happened to her during all this time, and how many of those rumors were true. The woman began to cry. She promised to tell her uncle everything, and then Rowena told everything that happened to her, how she became the Duke's favorite after her friend's betrayal, how she was abandoned on the island, and then returned after the birth of her son. Jeremy digested the news. He was surprised that she now also had a child, and it turned out that he would teach her son. He said that he could not even imagine how she went through all this at her young age, and he admitted that it broke his heart. Rowena consoled her uncle that everything was fine now. She was sure that Damien would not be happy here. That's why I needed his help. But this could not be easy because the Duke was not some ordinary aristocrat. Jeremy asked that the island where the Duke left her was a resort somewhere in the south. He thought for a moment. He said that this would be the best way. A few days later, Killian asked Rowena how her tutor was. He said that Janak considered him an eccentric. The woman said that she also noticed a few quirks in him, but I thought he was a wonderful teacher, and besides, both she and Damien liked him. Killian said he was glad to hear that. He turned the conversation to another topic. I wondered what she was doing today. She replied that she went to the salon with Countess Selina, that she was going to organize a charity evening at the end of the year, and asked her for help, to which she responded with joy. Even during her time as a favorite, Rowena regularly received invitations from aristocrats, but this was just to advertise these events, or ingratiate himself with the Duke. So asking for help in organizing something so important was new to her. This was direct evidence that Rowena's social status in high society had risen to that of Duchess. Rowena was tying the Duke's tie. She said that the Countess was impressed by the banquet the day before, 
so she thought that she would be busy preparing for a while. After all, it was necessary to write invitations, hire musicians, and a chef. While the woman was tying and straightening her tie, the Duke felt an irresistible feeling. He brought his face closer to her and defiantly asked what would happen next. Rowena responded to his call, opening her mouth slightly for a kiss. Killian said he asked her a question. The woman began to feel shy in front of him. He asked what else she needed to do, and he began to kiss her neck. Rowena tried to overcome herself but began to moan. She said that she still needed to figure out the arrangement of vases and the location of the waiters. Killian said it looked like she was trying really hard. He said that the butler was also very pleased. He said that he thought she could be trusted with the keys to the wine cellar. Rowena's eyes widened at what she heard. The keys to the wine cellar were a symbol that meant that the Duke trusted her with all the affairs of the estate. This was what she dreamed of five years ago. And now, it was coming to life. But reality is an imitation, always and in everything losing to the dream. Rowena replied that she was not ready yet. She insisted that she still had a lot to learn. The woman asked if the Duke understood her, and he was sure that Miss Fallone was playing with him. He said that he agreed to play with her, while everything went on as usual, and he didn't care what was going on in her head. Even if she secretly hated him and wanted to kill him, he didn't care. The woman asked Killian not to say that. She insisted that she just needed time to think. She remembered that the Duke had treated her cruelly that time, and it was clear to him that she didn't love him, no matter how many times she said otherwise. Rowena asked what he was thinking about. I asked him if he thought it was still possible to start over. The woman pressed her head against Killian's chest. She sadly said that she had one request for him. Then, at their first meeting, Uncle Jeremy told his niece to listen to him carefully. He assured me that there was a way to escape. He assured that he would do anything to get her and her son out of here. He recommended asking the Duke to take her to that island on a date that he himself would indicate to her in the coming summer. And now Rowena told the Duke that she would like to visit that island again, on the island where he left her and married another woman. The boy was sitting by the window. He was interested in reading something written on paper. Melissa came in and asked him what the young master was doing. Demian said that this was Mr. Defonce's book. The maid was surprised. After all, it looked more like a manuscript. The boy said that this was later, that it had not yet been sent to print. He said that the main character of the book has the same name as him. The girl showed interest and asked what this book was about. The boy said that the hero of the book lived happily with his mother, although they did not have much money. But one day an evil dragon came and took my mother away. Then brave Demian decided to gather friends to save her, and he went to the good sorcerer for advice. The teacher came up and asked that he was also interested in what they were chatting about. Melissa sat down in surprise. He said that he had not yet sent this manuscript to the publishing house, and he said that it is not for everyone yet. The boy threw himself into the man's arms, greeting him from the bottom of his heart. He was also happy. He wished him good morning, calling him a tomboy. The man asked the girl to return the manuscript to him, and he asked why she came here. Melissa insisted that she just wanted to check on the young master. The teacher looked angrily at the maid. He asked if she remembered correctly that her name was Melissa. She confirmed it. He specified that she was Miss Rowena's personal servant, and he asked if she was allowed to just wander around the mansion when she didn't have work. Melissa asked her to forgive her. The man asked her to be more careful next time. The girl bowed to him obediently. When the maid left, Demian asked the teacher why he did this to her. He was sure that Melissa was good. The man said he had an inexplicable bad feeling about her. He reminded him that he had previously asked him to call him uncle when there were no strangers around. Demian began to reason that if Mr. Defonce was his mother's uncle, then he was his grandfather. The man praised him, but asked him to still call him uncle. He reminded Demian that his mother was going to the capital today, and he will go to her in two days, and it reminded me of their previous conversation with agreements. The boy remembered that he had to pretend that he did not notice anything and did not hear anything. The man explained to Demian that the affairs of adults were much more complicated than he might think, and he reminded that the boy was not to blame for anything. Damien said that he understood everything, and then his uncle asked if he had finished the work he gave him yesterday. I remembered that there were a lot of them there. The boy clenched his fists and said that it was too early for class, and he was sure that he still had time to complete the tasks. The teacher said that he was somehow suspicious and asked to show what he had already done. The maid was tying a bow on her golden hair. She told Miss Rowena that everything was ready, and now our heroine stood dressed in a luxurious, soft-colored dress with flowing golden long hair decorated with a white bow. She was a little timid herself. Joanna said admiringly that Miss Rowena was so beautiful, and Melissa said that the weather is warm today. 
but since they would arrive in the capital closer tonight, I advised her to throw a shawl on her. Rowena agreed, and she asked Melissa if everything was okay with her. I noticed that she was somewhat upset today. The maid admitted that she went to see Demian this morning and was scolded by Mr. Defonce. Rowena laughed and was surprised. Although she admitted that sometimes he could be simply scary, after laughing, she asked the maid to give her a shawl. Melissa promised to return soon. When she left, Joanna quietly asked the mistresses in her ear if she had noticed anything strange in the girl. Rowena shrugged. The maid was sure that her colleague regularly ran to see someone. And this someone, Mr. Janik, is his lordship's secretary. Miss Fallone asked the maid if she was sure, and Joanna said that since their rooms are next door. She noticed that Melissa had been running away late at night lately, and at first she thought that the girl was just walking, but the fact that she leaves almost every night seemed strange to her. That's why she decided to follow her. Joanna saw that she was meeting with Mr. Janik in the servant's dining room. Rowena wondered why they would hide, and the girl said that servants were forbidden to have romantic relationships. The girl said with delight that they had a love that was not afraid of even the difference in social status. Rowena heard footsteps at the door and invited Melissa to come in. She was surprised that she ran so fast. But a man wearing dark leather shoes walked through the door. He said he was disappointed in Rowena, that she still didn't recognize his steps. The duke straightened his hair with his right hand, as was his habit. The woman asked his lordship why he was here, and she was sure that they still had a few hours before leaving. Killian asked why she left him. Rowena replied that she was simply embarrassed by his pressure, but the man assumed that she was hiding something from him. He voiced his guess by taking the woman's chin and looking into her eyes. Joanna asked her to forgive her and hurried to leave the room, seeing that she was clearly unnecessary here. The woman answered that it seemed to him, but the Duke was sure that she had definitely been preoccupied with something lately. Rowena said that she would like to ask him one question. Did he think about her request? She assured that every time she remembers about that island, only bad memories pop up in her head. The Duke listened to her attentively with a serious face, and the woman continued the thought that she would like to rewrite those memories with their new good moments. Killian didn't answer, but he asked the woman to turn to the mirror and close her eyes. He was quietly holding something in his hand behind her back. The blonde was intrigued and smiled slightly in response. When Rowena's eyes were closed, the Duke fastened a precious necklace at the back of her neck. He said that first, they would go to the capital and arrange as many receptions there as they liked. He said that there they would watch as many performances as they wanted, and then the two of them will go to that ill-fated island. Rowena was surprised by the necklace that the Duke put on her. He asked if she liked it. The woman replied that she liked it very much, adding that he was simply wonderful. She clarified whether this was not a royal heirloom. Killian remembered that she had worn something like this before, and I didn't understand why this suddenly began to worry her now. Rowena didn't answer, but she thought that she was blind and naive then, that back then she didn't understand how the world worked, and I didn't know what was possible and what was not. Our heroine didn't realize then that people would point fingers at her if she wore something so expensive, and she had no idea that she had become a woman with whom it is a shame to appear before God. Rowena replied that if it was truly a family jewel, then she should not have worn it. Killian spoke into her ear that nothing has fundamentally changed since then. He already told her that she just had to behave properly. Do not question anything and do not ask questions. He asked her to eat the food he fed her, wearing the clothes he chose for her, and do exactly what he told her to do. She answered him, Okay, as you order. There was a knock on the door. The voice said it was Melissa and asked if she could come in. Rowena allowed her to enter, and Killian began to kiss Rowena on the lips. When the door opened, Melissa faced the duke on the threshold. Throwing over his shoulder to Rowena, he said that he would be waiting for her outside. The maid rushed to Miss Rowena. I asked her if everything was okay with her and where Joanna had gone. She replied that the maid left immediately when the duke entered here. Melissa asked for forgiveness that it took her so long to find the shawl. The mistress did not blame her for this and asked if she would help her dress. The maid was throwing a shawl over Rowena's shoulders. The girl asked how long they were going to the capital. The lady said that they would stay there all spring, and in the summer they will go to the island. Melissa was surprised, and Rowena reminded her that she had also been there before, and she said that she wanted to go there again. The girl asked the lady if she was sure of such a need. Rowena answered in the affirmative. She was sure that the past should remain in the past. Melissa told his lordship that she had something to tell him, and she admitted that everything was a lie, that Miss Rowena was actually faithful to him. Killian asked the maid who told her to lie. She stuttered out, Baron Sussex and the duke thought to himself that he too had guesses about this. 
He asked Melissa to act as if nothing had happened. She asked for forgiveness for the lack of understanding and clarified what this meant. The Duke said that she should have behaved the same way as always with Miss Fallone and report to him about everything she does. He ordered in a threatening tone that she should not dare to lie to him anymore. On the street, a boy was delivering fresh newspapers. He announced that Duke Killian Devonshire was returning to the capital with his favorite. The Duke of Devonshire once used his wedding and subsequent honeymoon as excuses to stay away from the capital. Therefore, as soon as the press found out about his return in the company of his former favorite, a real scandal arose. The ladies gossiped about this day and night, washing their bones and spreading even more dirty gossip. One of them said that her relative, who lives not far from the Duke, said that Miss Fallone had not changed at all over the years. Another said that she somehow felt uneasy. After all, she was kicked out in disgrace by the man with whom she had been for three years, and she returned to him like a faithful little dog, not respecting herself at all. The third agreed with her, wondering what people are capable of for the sake of money and power, and she was inclined to believe that she could secretly conceive a child from him. The ladies at the table disagreed. One said that, according to rumors, the previous duchess could not have children, and if the favorite gave birth to a child for the duke, this would explain why he decided to return her. And then she would voluntarily become his favorite, dreaming of becoming the mother of the future duke. The older lady, giggling, marveled at Viscountess Estelle's imagination, which was the youngest of the ladies present. She said that his lordship had received Miss Philone four months ago, and if her assumption were true, the duke had long ago announced his heir. Moreover, if she were in the duke's place, she would not want to become the heir of a child born out of wedlock, and she would have ordered the secret murder of Miss Philone and announced that he had a child from his ex-wife. The third lady suggested changing the topic and talking about something else. She reminded me that they were all refined people gathered here, and they still couldn't understand that vulgar woman. The lady said that they should be so above this topic, but Rowena, who came out to them, managed to hear part of their conversation, and she was surprised that they were having a conversation in full swing. Miss Fallone looked blooming and happy. She greeted us and said that they had not seen each other for a long time, politely asked how things were going. The lady stammered and said that she didn't notice Miss Filoni coming. The blonde laughingly asked for forgiveness, and she assured that she had overheard their conversation from the waiting room, and he seemed so interesting to her that she did not even dare to interrupt him. The older lady said it was nothing and asked Miss Filoni to sit next to her. Viscountess Estelle asked to wait. She was sure that this place belonged to a respected aristocrat, and she was afraid that someone who was not one was not supposed to occupy it, so as not to show Countess Rachel in a bad light. Rowena marveled at Viscountess Estelle's extreme bravery. The lady was taken aback by this statement. Rowena continued that, with her remark, she insulted not only the Countess who invited her, but also the Duke of Devonshire himself. And will she take responsibility for her words? The Viscountess began to scream furiously. She was sure that she had only pointed to a person who should not be there and she wondered to herself why this woman behaved so differently. After all, five years ago she stood as if she had filled her mouth with water, although she was reviled with the last words, and she believed that this slob would never have ended up here if not for her beauty, and she didn't understand how she dared to shake the rights here. She said she understood Miss Fallone's lack of education and etiquette, but she believed that there were things that were considered unacceptable and things that should not have been allowed and they all relied on the social status and position of a person in society. Rowena thanked her for the lesson, and she asked permission to ask Viscountess Estelle one question. Was it considered acceptable to spread dirty and false gossip about a member of the royal family? Our heroine looked determined and fighting. The Viscountess stammered that she meant nothing of the kind, that they were just chatting. She said that she did not understand why she was suddenly accused of something. Rowena suggested that the girl take a walk. She asked her again. The blonde said that if she repeated the same words in front of other people, then she would admit that they were just chatting. For example, she offered to say those words in front of Duke Killian of Devonshire, and she suggested that Viscountess Estelle go to him together. Our heroine extended her hand, inviting the impudent one to go with her and resolve their dispute. But the Viscountess knew that the Duke of Devonshire was cruel and merciless. This was a well-known fact, and she didn't want to end up in his bad standing. Estelle replied that she had not thought properly. She apologized to Miss Filone, assuring that from now on he will watch his words. Countess Rachel assured Miss Filone that it was clear from Lady Estelle's appearance that she was sincerely sorry, and she hoped that she would find the generosity within herself to forgive. She said that, however, Estelle's words very clearly showed disrespect for the royal family, and such behavior could not be left without punishment. 
Therefore, she promised from now on not to invite Viscountess Estelle to her social events. Our heroine was clearly not in a good mood, but the Viscountess was also furious. She was restrained by the Countess. She knew that Countess Rachel's influence on the capital's high society was difficult to overestimate, and it turned out that with this statement, she simply broke all ties with her. One could say that the Countess had banished Lady Estelle from high society. The girl was on her knees in front of the Countess, begging her, but she called the servants to take the drunken mistress, who was no longer responsible for her actions, to the sofa. The Viscountess at the door shouted something else to the Countess, but she was already having a nice conversation with Rowena, and as the person who invited her and the Duke, she apologized for what she had to see and hear. The blonde replied that she had nothing to apologize for. The noble lady pushed back her chair at their table. She said that now she has two free places, that she always leaves one in case of unexpected guests, but I considered two to be too much. The Countess said that she would be extremely grateful if Miss Philone took one of them. Already late on a starry night, the Duke of Devonshire's carriage drove up to his capital castle. Killian was clearly tired and could hardly drag his feet. He admitted to Rowena that he was incredibly tired, and the blonde sympathetically asked how much he had to do. He said that he had heard about a small incident, and as far as he knew Rowena had mentioned the royal family. The woman was frightened and confused. She repented to the Duke that it was unreasonable on her part. Killian grinned contentedly, and he asked the woman to continue in the same spirit, which made our heroine even more puzzled. The duke instructed her not to allow aristocratic women to wipe their feet on her, continue to do the same as today. I thought it was better than crying afterwards. Rowena was even more surprised, and she asked how he knew that she was crying. The man raised his finger to her lips, thus calling for silence. He threw her onto the bed. He said that she deserved a reward today. Asim, meanwhile, was stretching the knot of the tie around his neck. Early in the morning the sun was shining through the window. Sleepy Rowena rubbed her eyes. Seeing a male figure in the room she thought it was the Duke, and she began to tell him something. But he replied that his lordship had already left early in the morning. The blonde finally woke up and saw that she had made a mistake. There was a silent question on her face. Mr. Janik asked Miss Fallone to forgive his intrusion. The woman asked him what he was doing in the Duke's room. He said that the Duke left on his own, but he ordered that Rowena be asked. Does she know a woman named Carol Burdimer? Our heroine, of course, knew her. After all, how could you forget her? They communicated so much by correspondence back then when they were young. Her ex-friend who invited her to the capital. And then she ran away, leaving a huge debt on her. And no matter how much Rowena looked for her, nothing came of it. The woman asked how he knew this name. The Duke's secretary summed up what it means that Miss knew that person. He handed her a small piece of paper. He said that his lordship left her an order, and he asked her to go with the maid to the specified address. People in poor clothes were sitting under the wall. One elderly couple was sitting next to a bucket. Another younger man sat next to him with a mug and a sleeping bag. Melissa looked at her mistress in horror. She told Miss Rowena that they seemed to have arrived in some bad place. I assumed they had the wrong address. Rowena agreed that there was still a place, but having specified the address on a piece of paper, she said that they had arrived correctly. The Duke's carriage stopped at one of the many similar two-story houses. The maid told Miss Rowena that something was obviously wrong, that his lordship would never have sent her to such a place. The blonde proudly declared that if she was scared, she could wait for her in the carriage. Our heroine resolutely entered the entrance of the house at the indicated address. Wooden steps led to the top. The woman recognized that very place. Women's feet and expensive high-heeled shoes climbed up the steps. She remembered how she climbed them a long time ago, and she was half filled with expectations, half with excitement. This was on the first day of her arrival in the capital. The name of her ex-friend. The address where she arrived. Rowena clutched a piece of paper in her hand. She understood that this was not a mere coincidence. But she didn't understand what Killian was trying to achieve. Our heroine stood indecisively in front of the closed door, wondering what awaited her there. Then she grabbed the handle and pulled it towards herself. There, from the darkness of the room, she heard words of prayer. Having gotten used to the poor lighting, Rowena saw a tightly bound woman. She asked to be spared. The blonde recognized her ex-friend Carol. She also recognized Rowena and even smiled, asking if she remembered her. The woman's face was covered in blood and tears. She began to beg Rowena to help her and save her. She sat tied to a chair. Her dress was dirty and she looked unhappy. A male figure emerged from a dark corner. It was Duke Killian. He asked if Rowena remembered his promise. There was a pistol in his hands. He had previously promised her a reward. The man said that this person was hiding under the name of Rowena Filone and worked as a courtesan. Killian said he didn't like debt. 
Everything she receives, both as a manifestation of generosity and as a manifestation of betrayal, comes from other people's debts. He said that he always pays his own. The Duke placed the pistol in Rowena's hands and cocked the hammer. He helped her point the gun at the woman. He said it was time for Rowena, too. Our heroine held a firearm in her hands for the first time in her life. She looked confused. Killian was nearby, assisting her and teaching her. He asked if she was offended by that woman. The man said that if he were in her place, he would simply seethe with anger. He said that if she herself could not pull the trigger, she could ask someone else to do it. And if it seems to her that she does not deserve a quick and painless death, then she can leave her alive and take it out on her as much as she likes. But Rowena put the pistol on safety and lowered it. She resolutely replied that she categorically refused this method. The Duke was extremely surprised. The blonde assured that she would be lying if she said that she hated and cursed this person. But she swore that if she ever saw her again, she would hit her well. Carol was crying. Rowena said that she did not want such revenge and considered it wrong. Killian asked her if he thought what this woman did was right. Rowena sadly admitted that Carol had used and betrayed her, but she didn't want to be like her. Rowena looked up at the woman, and she declared that she was not like that, and she will not live like Killian Devonshire, which amazed the Duke even more. The Duke turned and said, chuckling, that Rowena was free to do as she pleased. The blonde walked up to Carol. She asked not to touch her and leave her alone, but Rowena began to untie his hands behind his back. She spoke comforting words to her. Rowena assured the woman that everything was fine, and she sincerely asked Rowena for forgiveness. The blonde assured that she would now be safe, but then her strength left her and she fainted. Killian just managed to catch her in his arms. He assumed that she was just a little worried. Carol looked at the Duke with fear in her eyes. She begged him not to kill her. He said that Rowena spared her, and he respects her choice. But he believed that she still had to pay. Killian assured her that, unfortunately for her, he was not like Rowena. Capital Castle of the Duke of Devonshire. A carriage with insignia drove up to the main entrance. The Duke entered the room and carefully laid the unconscious Rowena on the bed. Baron Benedict Sussex was his faithful servant. He was the first to extend his hand to the Duke when he was orphaned. Therefore, Killian did not even doubt the words that he said five years ago. He didn't even imagine that his faithful dog had been yearning to grab the throat of the most precious thing he had all this time. The Duke clenched his fists in anger. He admitted to himself that he would like to kill him right now. Rowena lay unconscious. He stood over her and was surprised. It turned out that she was a woman who refused revenge, although the traitor was right in front of her. He wanted to test her dignity, so that he and she would be in the same boat, so to speak, on the same level. But she chose forgiveness. Although the traitor was right in front of her, and the weapon was in his hands, Killian thought she was just an angel, and he hoped that if she could forgive that woman, it meant that he had a chance and that all was not lost. Joanna was knocking on the door. She asked permission to enter and opened the doors to the room. But when the maid saw the duke, she became embarrassed. She bowed and asked his lordship for forgiveness. Killian asked if the child was at home now. And where was he now? Joanna remembered hearing that the gentleman didn't really like Demian. She answered that the boy fell asleep in the carriage, so the nanny took him to the room. The duke was tense and thoughtful. He said that Rowena was still sleeping, and I wanted to see how the boy was doing. The maid asked again apologetically. The stars were shining through the nursery window. The child was sleeping peacefully, carefully covered with a blanket. The duke timidly and quietly approached the sleeping boy. He touched his ear and hair. When he saw him, he knew for sure that it was his son. This boy had blood from his blood, the existence of which he did not know and did not even suspect for so long. The child had dreams. He felt someone's warm and soft hand stroking him. But who stroked him? Not a nanny or a mom. The sensations were different as if there was something he was really missing. In the morning, Damien woke up and sat up in bed, stretching sweetly. The nanny brought a bowl of clean water for the child to wash. The woman noticed that the young master was in a good mood today. Damien said that he had a good dream, but he did not remember what was there. And he asked when he could see his mother. The nanny answered that it would be this evening, and in the afternoon she suggested going to the capital. She remembered that there was a large park nearby. Demian was surprised that he could leave the house at will. The woman replied that she herself was surprised when the duke told her his permission this morning. The boy thought it was simply amazing. The park was spacious and elegant. There were bridges across the river, and a switched-on fountain refreshed the air for vacationers. Damian was delighted. He saw ducks swimming in the lake. The child sat on the bench and enjoyed the spectacle. The nanny called him a dear boy and asked him not to go anywhere but to wait for her here. She was going to get them something to eat. Soon a man unfamiliar to Demian sat down on the bench 
He was a little annoyed by that, and he told the stranger that it was busy here. The man was surprised. He didn't even know that public benches could belong to someone. Damien noticed that the man was handsome, but very angry. The stranger asked the boy what he admired. Demian admitted that he was fascinated by the swimming family of ducks. He said he loved ducks, that this is his favorite animal. The brunette wondered why ducks. The boy said that the mother duck always stays with the father duck, and together they protect their children. And he was always happy when he saw them. Demian said that he also has a family, his mother. The man asked about his father. The boy said that according to his mother, he was somewhere far away. That's why I couldn't come to them. But it seemed to him that if they met him, he would love him very much. That maybe they were far from each other now, but he would immediately understand that it was his son when he saw him. The Duke said that it would be so. The boy wanted to ask Mr. Stranger something else, but then they heard a scream. The boy was surprised and the man was wary. Killian asked what was happening. The park workers asked to quickly leave here. One of them quietly said that a wolf had escaped from a nearby zoo and was now wandering around this park. Another swore that there was also a child here. Killian clenched his teeth in frustration. Damien was tugging at his pants. He called Mr. to look. Powerful paws with long claws walked along the paved path of the park. Saliva dripped from the predator's mouth. The boy was seriously scared and froze. The white wolf was dangerously close to the child and the duke. Killian grabbed the child with his right hand and lifted him higher, and with his left he hit the predator attacking them with force. Blood spattered. The duke gritted his teeth. The boy screamed as loud as he could. Soon the police were running with their guns. They asked if everything was okay. A nanny was wailing nearby. There was a bloody wolf lying on the park path. The woman felt the child's integrity and asked if he was injured. The boy assured her that he was fine, but he was worried about his uncle. Damien turned around, but Mr. Stranger was no longer there. He wondered where he could have gone so quickly. The child was scared and huddled close to the woman. The nanny blamed herself and realized that everything could have ended much worse. And she invited the boy to return home as soon as possible. Our heroine opened her eyes. She recognized her capital's chambers. Then she remembered that before that she lost consciousness. Melissa carried a glass on a tray. She rejoiced at Miss Rowena's awakening and asked how she was feeling. The blonde said it wasn't bad and asked to bring water. She asked how long she had been unconscious. A glass of water was passed into the hands. The maid said that the lady slept the whole day. Rowena asked what happened to the woman who called herself Carol. Melissa said that she saw her go somewhere with the Duke. It seems he has decided to let her go. But he made her promise in writing that she would never do anything like that again. Rowena asked where the Duke is now. The maid answered that he had business and said that he would not be at home for some time. He also asked me to tell you that if Rowena wants, she can sleep with Demian. The woman was surprised that Demian was also here. The door opened and a boy entered. He immediately rushed into his mother's arms. The child hugged the woman. He told his mother that he missed her so much. She answered that she also missed him very much and asked how he was doing. Demian briefly said that he was in the park today, and how a wolf attacked him. Some terrible animal almost bit him, but he was saved by an unfamiliar and strange man. Rowena thanked the heavens that her son was okay, and pressed her cheek to the child's cheek. Then she asked what the name of the person who saved him was. The boy admitted that he did not ask his name. But I definitely remembered that the beast had wounded that man's hand. Demian suggested that his mother go to that park one more time. The woman did not understand why this was necessary. The boy said that he would like to see that guy again. The next day, Demian again observed a family of ducks in a park pond, sitting on the same bench. She and her mother sat in the park for a very long time. But the man Demian was looking for never showed up. A carriage with a pair of white horses rode along the streets of the capital. The boy was upset. Rowena assumed that the stranger could be in the hospital, since he was wounded at the time. Melissa argued that if the wound was serious, then anything could happen, and she promised to start searching. Rowena, smiling, thanked the maid for her support and help. She also suggested asking Mr. Janik for help. After all, it was important for her to personally thank the person who saved her son. By the way, the maid was telling Miss Rowena if she had already heard the news from the newspapers, that from tomorrow and throughout the week, the royal lands will be open to ordinary people. The boy asked what it was. Melissa showed him the photograph in the newspaper. She said that it was such a big forest with a lot of rabbits and deer in it. Demian told his mother that he would like to go there too. Rowena promised that if her son behaved well, she would definitely go there with him. But all I had to do was eat all the vegetables and listen to the nanny. The boy happily promised and told his mother that they had come to an agreement with her. The maid looked out of the window of their carriage with interest. Rowena asked her what was there. 
Melissa said that some woman stopped their cart and now she is coming here. The woman outside asked Miss Falone. Our heroine recognized the voice of Duchess Rachel. She asked Melissa to hide Damien behind her back, and she herself got out of the carriage to the meeting. She told the Duchess that it was a pleasant surprise for her to unexpectedly meet with her, and the woman in formal clothes said that she thought so, and she asked where Miss Falone was returning from. Duchess Rachel said the weather was wonderful today, and she was surprised that the cart was curtained. Rowena replied that she simply did not want to attract unnecessary attention to herself, and I decided to get some fresh air today, so I walked in the park. Then the sound of sneezing was heard from the carriage. The Duchess asked who Miss Falone was going with. She answered that she was with her maid, but the woman was sure that it was the sound of a child. She assured that she had four of her own, and she always recognized this sound. Melissa hid the boy, and he covered his mouth and nose. Finally, Mrs. Rachel looked at the child. She spoke with delight that she had never seen such a sweet little gentleman, and she wondered why he decided to hide. Rowena said he was the Duke's nephew, that he is a relative and came from abroad, that he knew the local language very well, so he was very shy. The Countess was surprised. She admitted that this was the first time she had heard that the Duke had a nephew. She asked permission from Miss Falone to steal a few minutes of her time. Rowena asked in surprise at the need to do this right now. Mrs. Rachel assured the blonde that this was very important, and that she probably won't regret it since it was only in her interests. The woman turned and turning to the maid, said that she would be gone for a while, and asked her to look after the boy. The countess led the guest into the living room of her house. She quickly poured her tea. She asked if she understood that her current position was very precarious. Rowena asked what she meant. The older woman said that she did not understand the court by the reaction of her interlocutor. The hostess said that recently, the queen invited the daughter of the Marquis Talden to the royal castle, and that girl came in through the back door, not through the main entrance. Rowena did not understand what the conclusion was from this. The countess chuckled disapprovingly, and she said that in her opinion, Miss Falone was one of the most innocent girls she had ever met in her life, and she explained that this meant that the queen had secretly chosen Lady Talden to be the Duchess of Devonshire. The woman asked if Miss Rowena had noticed any changes in the duke's behavior. Our heroine remembered how Melissa said that the duke had some business, so he would not be at home for some time, and that he allowed her to sleep with her son if she wanted. And now she understood that all this was not without reason. Mrs. Rachel insisted that she understood that such news could be shocking, but there was nothing to be done. She began to console the guest, and she said that aristocrats do not always manage to choose their own spouse, and she asked Miss Falone to listen to her, that she might only be his favorite, but as long as she had the Duke's support, she could have all the power she wanted. And the Duchess, left without the attention and love of her husband, will be only a doll in his hands. She recalled that she had kicked out Viscountess Estelle. Therefore, she offered to take her place. The Countess assured Rowena that she and she were now in the same boat. She assured that she would do everything in her power to help her maintain the Duke's favor. Rowena said that she understood everything and thanked her for the advice. The woman asked permission to ask the Countess something. She said that you can ask questions without undue embarrassment. Rowena was interested in the appearance of the Marquis's daughter. Was she a green-eyed blonde? Mrs. Rachel couldn't say for sure about the color of her eyes, but she heard that she was brown-haired. Our heroine herself didn't know why she suddenly became interested in this. She looked at her reflection in the tea. Rowena understood that marriage might not mean anything to the Duke and might not evoke a response in his soul. After all, his favorite was enough for him to replace the woman he had loved for a long time. Already at night, Rowena had a conversation with her uncle. He asked that it turned out that the Duke was marrying a second time. Rowena confirmed this and she was sure that there was no longer a need for them to escape secretly. She hoped that if the wedding went ahead, they would get rid of her again. At the same time, she sadly looked out the window, and she believed that she only needed to keep Demi in secret until then. But it's not like anyone really cares. The woman said that from the very beginning she was just a toy, a replacement for his beloved. But now the Duke will have a new toy, and that he won't need the old one with which he played around before. She couldn't believe that Damien was the son of such a cruel and heartless man. Rowena cried bitterly, standing at the window. Uncle Jeremy began to console her. He stroked her shoulder, and he told her to calm down and that everything was really not as it seemed to her. He believed that the Duke had no plans to let her go. The man said that ever since he arrived here, he had been paying very close attention to how the Duke behaved around Rowena, and he noticed that he always had only one expression on his face, a dark, frightening obsession. Rowena couldn't believe it, and asked if her uncle was sure, and he replied that his intuition had never deceived him, and it turned out that he and his niece had nothing to rejoice at. 
He still wanted to tell her something about the Duke, but then he changed his mind, thinking that it was better to keep it to himself. He thought that if he brought this to her attention, her feelings for Killian would flare up again. But their sudden freedom did not last long. The Duke, who had been missing for some time, suddenly appeared in the middle of the night. Rowena greeted him with greetings. The woman reproached him for disappearing and not telling her anything. She insisted that she was worried about him. He was surprised why she would worry about him. Rowena insisted that she always worried when he was not around, and she herself noticed that something seemed to have changed in him. But she couldn't understand what exactly. Rowena had the same feeling as after five years of separation, and then she noticed his hand and asked what happened to him. Killian brushed it off as nothing, insisting that he had just cut himself on glass and she had nothing to worry about. But the woman asked him not to say that, realizing that everything was serious since he was wearing a blindfold. In response, the Duke only clenched his teeth in frustration. He was surprised that she could be so interested in what he was doing. Killian wondered if she was just as curious five years ago, or if she had suddenly developed a new habit. Rowena said that she noticed that he was upset about something. She said that she would sleep in another room today, so she was about to let him go. But the Duke stopped her. He said that he wanted to ask her something. He was interested in what her life was like during those five years that he was not with her. Rowena realized that he had not asked this question even once since their reunion. Moreover, the Duke always avoided this topic in conversation very carefully. It was as if he wanted to cut this moment of his life out of his memory. The woman was surprised that this suddenly interested him, but he replied that it was simple curiosity. Rowena briefly replied that her life was normal, that her life may have been miserable, as he called it, but she lived calmly and happily, happier than ever. Our heroine did not want to tell the details so as not to cry in front of him, but even now I could barely contain my emotions. She turned her back on the Duke. She said that if such an answer was enough for him, she asked her to forgive her. Killian asked how the birth went. Rowena angrily wondered why he needed to know this, but she answered that she almost died then, that she went to work with her belly protruding, and one cold winter night she simply gave birth in an old house after a day of work. That was all. No more and no less. Rowena asked the Duke if he was pleased with the story of how worthless her life was. She asked if he had learned everything and asked his permission to leave. Killian admitted that he was thinking about getting a dog, and this time it was a duty he took on forever. He said that fox hunting season would begin soon and he could use an obedient hound. He reported that tomorrow they would go to the breeder to see what he had to offer, and he wanted the child to go with them too. Rowena was alarmed by this wish of his. The woman tried to dissuade the duke. She assured him that he would not like being around the boy. He was surprised why she suddenly decided, and she answered because it has always been like that. Killian said that then they would leave him with a nanny, to be far away from him so that he can't be seen. I asked if she was happy with this decision. Rowena wondered why he wanted to take Damien with him. The Duke said that children were simply better at understanding animals than adults. The breeder showed the puppy. He sat obediently with his tongue hanging out. One of his ears was still standing. The man said that this was the most popular breed now. He assured that the puppy had a good pedigree and was very well trained. He was also brave and could fight an enemy ten times his size. Killian considered this feature more stupid than brave. The breeder hesitated not finding anything to answer to such a caustic remark from the Duke, and I thought to myself, swearing, that when he heard that the Duke of Devonshire was coming to him, he tried to prepare as well as he could, but it turned out that serving him was more difficult than thought. Out of the corner of his eye, the man also noticed a green-eyed blonde beauty next to the buyer. She knew that this was the same Rowena Filoni, and suddenly I realized that what was needed was not a hound, but a pet for the Duke's favorite. He brought another puppy closer to the woman, he said that they still have such a charming companion. He assured me that he was very nice. Rowena was a little confused, but after a pause she stroked the beast. He immediately sniffed her and tickled her. At this time another puppy ran and jumped into Demian's arms. He licked the boy's cheek, and he laughed cheerfully in response. The nanny was extremely concerned about what was happening. At some point, the animal knocked the child onto his back, but continued to lick his face. The boy laughed and had fun. When the breeder saw it, he stuttered and asked for forgiveness. He insisted, sighing, that he was very sorry that this had happened. He apologized to the young master and asked if he himself was okay. The boy assured that everything was fine with him and was sure that this cute puppy really liked him. The man said that this dog had no pedigree and he was a little stupid. That's why no one took it for themselves. And they were already planning to put him to sleep today. The boy asked what put to sleep meant. His huge blue eyes instantly became sad. 
The man tried to find the right word so as not to hurt the impressionable child. But then Killian said that they would take this dog for themselves. Rowena couldn't believe her ears. The Duke ordered Jenok to pay, and he himself hurried, saying that they still had to get somewhere. And Demian happily hugged the puppy. Rowena asked Killian where they were going. The carriage rushed down the street. Later he went out and called a woman with him to accompany him. He walked ahead and she could barely keep up with him. The Duke asked why it took her so long to get ready, and taking her hand he called her to walk next to him. The woman was surprised. She asked Killian to wait, and he continued to pull her hand forward. She couldn't understand why he was doing this. After all, from their first meeting in public, he always kept his distance from her. The Duke regularly took Rowena to public places, but the favorite was just a favorite. Unlike his wife, with whom he has an oath before God, the favorite can never raise her head. Rowena was scared. She didn't like it. There was something against her, against the warmth of his hands and against the sudden changes in his behavior, and against her wishes to give him another chance. She begged Killian to let her go. She said that people on the street had already started looking at them askance. The Duke, looking over his shoulder, was surprised that she was somehow too sociable today, and he asked why she suddenly became so ashamed. He said they did worse things to her. Rowena said that wasn't the point. He asked to end the argument because they had already arrived. Our heroine couldn't believe her eyes. They stood in front of a large building with huge windows. They were met in the hall by a sweetly smiling girl. She politely invited them to the best studio in the capital. She asked permission from the miss to take her measurements. She asked me to follow her. Rowena was even a little confused and timid. The blonde looked back at the duke, looking for his support, but he was busy choosing a model of dresses in the catalog. When Rowena came out in the girl's new dress, the salespeople unanimously began to assure that she looked simply stunning. But the woman assured his lordship that this dress was too beautiful for her, and it seemed to her that it did not suit her. The duke came closer and began to play with a lock of her golden hair. He was sure that this model suited her very well. The sellers were extremely surprised by what was happening before their eyes. It was already getting dark when the Duke of Devonshire's carriage moved away from that famous studio in the capital. After that, they also went to the jewelry store and bought accessories, and Rowena was completely exhausted. Already in the carriage, she asked Killian why all this was happening. He asked what exactly. The woman was surprised that he suddenly decided to take her hand in public. Then I bought an expensive dress. She did not understand what this ostentatious display of sympathy was for. Killian replied that he just suddenly wanted it, and there was no need for some funny reason for this. The woman clenched her fists. She said she was just worried that he might get in trouble if they drew so much attention to themselves. After all, he will soon marry again. Killian sat with his hands folded in front of the blonde in the carriage opposite her. His face did not express any emotion. With a pause to think, he asked again, What? Rowena said that she heard that the queen had already chosen a new wife for him. And if his potential wife finds out about their walk today, then everything could be bad. The duke asked who told her this. The woman was silent. He asked him not to torment him. He assured me that he was very interested, and he would love to know who they are going to marry him this time. Rowena thought she had made a mistake, and she shouldn't have said anything like that to the duke. After all, he could solve his problems differently from other people. She remembered the firearm in his hands, the woman believed that it was impossible to understand him, and it was better not to even try. And sitting on the soft seat of the carriage, she stuttered and said that she knew nothing more, that she just heard it out of the corner of her ear. Killian was sure that, judging by the way this conversation began, she herself did not know. But he believed that she was still really looking forward to him marrying again. He asked Rowena to tell him honestly, does she want him to marry another woman and have a child with her? Our heroine could not understand why the duke asked her such an obvious question. She sincerely wanted to free herself from this man. But she didn't want to see another woman near Killian Devonshire. After all, he used her as a replacement for his dead bride and ruined her entire life. And now let him not think about falling in love with another woman and living happily with her. Rowena, with lowered eyes, answered the duke that she herself was not from a noble family. And her past cannot be called worthy either. She assured him that she had not even harbored the idea that she could become a duchess, and she has enough intelligence to understand that their relationship must end. Killian suddenly began to passionately kiss the blonde on the lips. It was passionate, tender. At some point, Rowena simply dissolved in the feelings of pleasure with each other that washed over her. She understood that everything was like that, and their relationship would turn into a disaster and it was inevitable. But if it was God's will, he would forgive her a little evil. She was going to rip Killian's heart apart. The woman wanted him to suffer more than she suffered. But in order to completely fool him, she had to mix love and hate within herself. And if she only whispered pleasant nonsense to him, 
He could immediately understand everything and see through her plan. She needed to be so sincere that she herself would not understand whether she was pretending or not. Rowena told the Duke that she would have one request for him. She wanted him to take her with him on the upcoming hunt, and so that he treats her the same way as today in front of his future bride. The woman said that fox hunting season was approaching, and the Duke of Devonshire is also going to take part in it. Rowena confirmed that she would go with him too. The Countess said that Miss Fallone turned out to be much smarter than she had previously thought about her. The blonde asked what she meant. The ladies walked in the sun on the green lawn, and the interlocutor explained that everyone in the area knows that Rowena and the Duke recently walked down the street holding hands. The blonde sighed languidly. The Duchess assured me that it didn't matter whether it was on purpose or not. She believed that what was more important was that the Duke's affection for her was irresistible. She admitted that she could not even think that something like this could be typical. She admitted that she was very surprised by that, and she believed that men really change when they are attracted to a woman. Rachel complimented Miss Fallone for doing such a good job, and she advised her to continue in the same spirit. The blonde was asking her permission to ask something. She was interested in why he decided to help her. After all, she herself was not an aristocrat. Wouldn't it be easier to support the lady from the Talden house? The countess assured that the miss was asking very bold questions. Rowena asked to forgive her if she crossed the line. The lady assured her that there was nothing wrong. She admitted that five years ago she did not have the best opinion of her. Then in front of her was a beautiful girl who was unhappy, although she was dressed in an expensive dress and hung with jewelry. And then she couldn't even imagine why she would want to run away. But when Rowena returned, there was a completely different woman in front of her. She admitted that she was captivated by how Miss Fallone put Viscountess Estelle in her place without even blinking an eye. Countess Rachel said that she would very much like to know what changed Miss Rowena so much. Our heroine herself thought about this question. She believed that there were indeed changes in her and I thought that it was worth thanking Damien for this. The Countess asked me to tell him what caused this, but the blonde laughingly insisted that she would like to keep it a secret. Mrs. Rachel feigned disappointment, but then she invited me to walk further. She assured her interlocutor that she had found a wonderful place in the sun. She offered them some tea. Miss Fallone said that the offer sounded tempting, but then suddenly her umbrella was snatched from her hands. This left her completely confused. The girl asked her to forgive her, and then she just pretended to recognize Miss Fallone. Our heroine's white umbrella lay on the grass. Rowena recognized Viscountess Estelle, and she said that only Miss Fallone could have such bad manners. She demanded that she immediately apologize to the girl she bumped into. The blonde said that she was just getting ready, but the Viscountess interrupted her. I asked if this was an apology, and she demanded that she apologize properly. Estelle assured that the girl she had the audacity to crash into was Lady Talden, the daughter of the Marquis Talden. The sweet young girl was a little shy before the looks. The brown-haired woman asked the Viscountess if this was the woman she had told her about, remembering that the stranger's name must have been Miss Rowena Fallone. She confirmed the correctness of Lady Veronica's guesses. The girl admitted that she was confused and was biting the tip of her nail quite childishly. She said that I used to think that such women sleep during the day and work at night. Rowena started to get angry, and she began to say something in response, but Countess Rachel interrupted her. She assured Lady Veronica that it was a little inappropriate. The woman introduced herself to the young lady that her name was Rachel, and she assumed that the girl must have been dating her older sister. Lady Veronica realized that this lady must be the sister of Countess Roderick, the royal maid of honor. The woman confirmed this and assured that she had heard about her arrival in the capital and was going to send an invitation. The girl thought about it. She knew that Countess Rachel occupied a very important place in the high society of the capital, and I thought it was better to make a good impression on her. Veronica said that she would be very happy if such a worthy woman invited her. The Countess thanked her for her kind words and apologized for her friend's ignorance. The girl laughingly insisted that they had just bumped into her by accident, and turning to her friend, she asked Viscountess Estelle to raise Miss Fallone's umbrella. She was simply furious. Lady Veronica asked if she thought that she herself should bend over for him, which angered Lady Estelle even more. She simply clenched her fists from the emotions overwhelming her. The Viscountess still found restraint in herself, and so she bent down to pick up and presented Miss Fallone with her fallen snow-white umbrella. Lady Veronica said that they were probably deviating and said goodbye to the ladies. She wished them a pleasant day. Duchess Rachel, when she and Rowena were alone, asked her not to be so nervous. She asked to forgive for the misunderstanding. After all, Lady Veronica began to behave differently when she found out who was in front of her. This means that she needed approval from the capital's aristocracy, and she could be understood. 
After all, even after her debut, she lived in her hometown. Her health did not allow otherwise, but she believed that this was not the main thing. It turned out that Lady Veronica had shamelessly insulted her, even though they had met for the first time. And after that, she forced Viscountess Estelle, her comrade, to do something humiliating. Miss Fallone was essentially her enemy, but she didn't even try to protect her people. Rowena clarified that this meant that there would be no problems with her. She asked because that's what Mrs. Rachel wanted to tell her. The noble lady confirmed this, and she said that she was glad that they understood each other. She said that now, in her opinion, it was time for lunch, but then Jenik approached Miss Fallone. The always calm man looked surprisingly worried. He asked for forgiveness for interfering in their conversation, and he said that he needed to tell him something. He volunteered to take her to the estate. He said that trouble had happened to young Mr. Demian. He said that this morning, he and the nanny were walking the dog. But the leash broke and the dog ran away. The boy chased after him, and the dog led him to a disadvantaged area of the city. And there the kid with the dog came across a homeless man. Rowena couldn't believe her ears. She worriedly asked what happened to her son. She asked not to torment her, but to tell her, preparing to hear the worst. 